Silent Witch. Vol 7. Chess Tournament Arc V7 C1. A Sorrow for Those Who Lack Azeroth GT Silent Witch July 21st. 2021 4 minutes during the class period, Lana Cola kept glancing sideways at Monica who has been feeling down lately. The reason must have been Casey's sudden withdrawal from school. Lana only heard about it from others, but she heard it was because of family reasons. Those who drop out of school due to family reasons were not uncommon in this academy. But for Monica, who has few friends, Casey's withdrawal must have come as a terrible shock. For the past few days, she has always been sad and downcast, even when talking to Lana, she has been strangely awkward. Even at lunch, while Lana was lashing out at Claudia, Monica was kind of in a daze. Looking back, it was Casey's presence at the lunch table that kept the place alive. Whenever Lana and Claudia got into an argument, Casey would moderately admonish them. And when Monica was silent, Casey would casually bring up the topic. Even Lana felt a little sad at Casey's withdrawal. Though the iron face Claudia probably didn't feel the same way. Eventually, when class was over, Lana approached Monica's desk. Monica was the type of person whose ups and downs were directly reflected in the way she dressed and styled her hair. As expected, she forgot to button her sleeves and some strands were sticking out of her braided hair in a silly manner. Lana approached Monica from behind and pressed on her sticking out hair with her fingers. You forgot to button your sleeves, huh? Ah, you're right. Monica hadn't realized this until she was approached by Lana. While Monica was fumbling to rebutton her sleeves, Lana held her hair that was sticking out and pinned it up in place. This should make her look a little better. We're going to have an elective class now. Hey, what class did you end up choosing, Monica? Um, my first choice is chess, and my second choice is law class. The chess class will start at today first period. Since we are going in the same direction, let's walk there together. Why yeah, nodding her head, Monica packed away her writing materials and stood up. Lana secretly pondered as she walked side by side with Monica. She had no idea what kind of topic to bring up at a time like this. She tried to come up with a variety of topics, but all that came to mind was the latest fad. And Lana could tell that Monica was not interested in such things. S. Speaking of which, Monica, have you decided on the dress to wear for the ball after the school festival? Monica stood blankly with her mouth agape and eyes rounded before turning her eyes toward Lana. Lana was expecting a response like I haven't prepared anything yet, but judging from Monica's expression, perhaps. Monica? You are aware that we will be having a ball on the night of the school festival, right? Yeah, I had read that on the schedule, but I assumed we were going to participate in uniform. Lana remembered now that Monica was a transfer student. In Serendia Academy, students basically wore uniforms during ceremonies. But for the balls held afterward, students naturally wore their own formal wear. Especially the ball held after the school festival and graduation ceremony was a grand affair. All the students dress up to the nines. Comma can't I attend in uniform, that's not a good idea, even for a student council member, ugh. Student council members were in charge of the venue of the ball. There was no way they could be absent. And if they attended the ball in their uniforms, it would only embarrass them. Comma Monica, do you have a dress? Monica shook her head mutely. As expected, thought Lana as she put her hand to her forehead. The school festival was just two weeks away. She didn't think that Monica could prepare the dress by herself. I'll lend you my old one if you like. It's already out of fashion in color and design, though, eh, but. Monica mumbled as she kneaded her fingers and cast her head down. Lana pursed her lips into a pout. What, you don't like my secondhand stuff, I, I don't mean it like that. I just, Monica's voice was kind of shaky like she was about to cry. Her unreliable eyebrows furrowed, and a film of tears slowly formed in her round eyes. I've always received so much help from you, and I haven't been able to give anything back. 
Monica's head was turning lower and lower. Eventually, all Lana could see was Monica's crown, so she pushed it with her fingers. I'm not expecting anything in return, even so, I I mean, you don't need a reason to be nice to your friends, right? Pulling her fingers back from the crown of her head, she saw Monica's head slowly lifts. Monica still looked bewildered. Comma thank you, Lana. Monica thanked her in a faint voice. The tears that should have receded a little, for some reason, filled up again along with a strong sense of guilt on her face. Can she honestly rely on Lana without any remorse? Lana folded her arms powdered and glared lightly at Monica. The dress needs to be adjusted a bit, so come to my room at another time. Anyway, Monica, do you wear a corset? I've never worn any, what? Lana always wore a light corset under her uniform, even now. For a girl in her late teens, this should be a matter of course, but when Lana took a closer look at Monica's figure, she was convinced. Her small figure, which could easily be said to be in her early teens, was too thin rather than slender. Comma W well, you certainly don't have any fat to tie up, still, if she tightened her waist more and stuffed her breasts, she would look a little more feminine. So Lana secretly vowed to herself to wear the corset she had used in her early teens. V7C2, listen, my colleague, the game has begun before you even sit down at the table. As Earth GT Silent Witch July 23, 2021 7 minutes Corey Lipson was a third year student at Serendia Academy. As the third son of a baronial family without any special skills, he chose the chess class as his elective course. He had been playing chess with his older brother since he was a child, so he thought he could play at least as well as anyone else. However, the level of chess class at Serendia Academy was far higher than Corey had expected. In that class, students were divided into three groups according to their skills, upper, middle, and lower. Basically, students in the same group play against each other and their rank would change depending on the winning percentage. Those who had won prizes in the past or had already taken chess classes in the previous year would be started in the upper or middle group, but Corey was grouped in the lower group. Moreover, he was at the bottom of the lower group. Such third-year students at the bottom of the class were naturally forced into the role of taking care of the first and second-year students. Okay. The first and second year students can start pairing up randomly with each other. After Corey gave a few cursory instructions, the juniors paired up with those closest to them and began to play the game. However, there was one girl who was standing there dazedly with no one to pair up with. She was a petite girl with light brown hair. Her figure was so small that one might think she was a student from middle school, but judging from her sleeve ornaments, she was a second-year student in high school. You're not getting a partner, Tip. I guess you could pair up with me. Oh, oh, okay. P please take care of me. The girl bowed her head and took a seat across from Corey. It was rare to see a female student in a chess class, after all. Not many girls took chess classes since they tended to be weaker than boys. In the first place, chess was primarily played by men. Lucky. So Corey secretly giggled. Students will keep track of their wins and losses in this class, and if their winning percentage was high enough, they could move to the higher group. Let's get a quick win against this girl. Raise my winning percentage, calculated Corey as he laid out his chess pieces. How long have you been playing chess? Have you participated in any tournaments? I've only got started recently. I read the manual and learn the rules. Yesterday, uh, there they are. Some people think they can play chess just by reading a manual. He was referring to himself, of course. Since this game will be recorded, I won't give you a handicap, is that okay? I am fine with it. The girl nodded and stared at the board. I think this will be a piece of cake, laughed Corey without showing it. Comma it's checkmate, the girl declared as she moved her black knight. Corey stared down at the board, breaking out into a cold sweat. Wait, 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 wait. 
Turning away from the board for a moment, he rubbed his eyes. Then, he looked at the board again. Wait, 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 what is this, what is this? Pondered Quarry. Before long, he covered his face with his hands and hung his head. To give an honest impression of this game, there was only one thing to say. Before I knew it, I had lost, with frightening speed and precision, the girl overwhelmed Corey. He knew how mercilessly strong she was. It was the same as when he played chess with a person from the higher group, if not better. Dot. I lost, when Corey surrendered. The girl let out a relieved breath and patted her chest. Then, all of a sudden, Corey's shoulders became very heavy. It wasn't that he was slumped over in his defeat. There was an arm on his shoulder and someone was leaning on him. When Corey twisted his head around, he saw Elliot Howard, his classmate, leaning over his shoulder, peering at the board. If this was just a classmate, he would have just brushed it off and said, what are you doing but Elliot Howard was a privileged classmate and a member of the student council. He's too different from him, who was the third son of a mediocre baronial family. Elliot looked at the board for a moment, leaned over, then tapped Corey on the shoulder. Do you mind switch a place with me, S. Shutter? As Corey quickly offered up his seat, Elliot took his place, sitting firmly in his chair. The girl sitting across from him jerked her shoulders. Elliot gave such a girl his usual frivolous smile and said, Hey, Miss Norton. How about you play with me this time, B-Bot? We're from different groups, no problem. Even if we're from different groups we can still play a match. Indeed, Elliot was right. No rule said the upper group and the lower group could not compete against each other. However, in this case, even if the upper group wins, it would not be counted. On the other hand, if the lower group wins, it will significantly affect their winning records. So, people in the upper group have nothing to gain by playing games with lower groups. To put it bluntly, it was just a waste of time. And no one had ever done it. And yet, Elliot volunteered to compete with a junior member of the lower group. Elliot was among the three best players in the upper group. It was said that his selection for the National Chess Tournament was virtually guaranteed. I mean, the chess tournament is just around the corner. How can he be thinking of playing against a junior member of a lower group at such a time? Skeptical, Corey left his seat to find his next opponent. Elliot picked up one of the black and white pieces, quickly reshuffled it under the desk and held his fist out in front of Monica. Choose whichever you like, I, I'll take this one. Then, Monica opened the hand she was pointing at, and what came out was a black king. Elliot went first in white, and Monica went after him in black. As Monica was arranging the black pieces, Elliot, who had quickly finished arranging them, muttered, say, resting his chin on his hand. Her arranging hand stopped and looked at Elliot. I is there something wrong, the other day's game, Elliot poked at the piece with his fingertips and spoke as if he were talking to himself. You knew I hadn't taught you the castling yet, and you also knew I won the game with it, so, why didn't you point it out in front of everyone, Monica blinked in surprise. The other day's game, her first game of chess, she still remembered it well. The game where Elliot's side has no queen and the first move was given to Monica. Monica had the upper hand in the beginning, but at the last minute, Elliot used a special move called castling to move rook and king, resulting in Monica's defeat. At that time, Monica didn't know the special move of castling, so it was natural for her to be defeated. As Monica was at a loss for an answer, Elliot continued with more words. You had every right to blame me. You can't even say to me that it's not a fair game. Suddenly, Monica remembered. For the past few days, Elliot had been acting strange, as if he wanted to say something to Monica in the student council room but only to slink away quickly. Could it have been because he wanted to mention this? Um, well, Monica carefully chose her words as she answered. Comma if it was someone I know. I'm sure he would have said this to me, 
You are foolish if you have taken a seat at the table only relying on the explanations of others without looking up the official rules for yourself needless to say whom that acquaintance she was referring to. As Monica giggled, remembering Lewis Miller's broad smile, Elliot looked at Monica with half-open eyes. Hey, that friend of yours, isn't he too much of a jerk? Well, but I really think he's got a point, he even said. The game has begun before you even sit down at the table Elliot let out a deep sigh and held up his hands in resignation. Come on, give me a break. It's not like I wanted to set you up so I didn't teach you castling. I knew there was no way a novice could understand castling, so I had underestimated your ability and tried to win without it. Honestly, Monica gave the vega, and Elliot ruffled his bangs as if he was upset. That's the part you should be angry about. I had underestimated you, got pissed off, and forced myself to win by using a castling move I didn't teach you. That was not fair. It was shameful and unbecoming of a noble. Um, Monica was at a loss. She had no idea what part of Elliot's words she should be angry about. Monica has never been angry when she was belittled. If anything, she felt more troubled when people pointed it out. She didn't see any reason to blame Elliot for not teaching her how to castling, especially if it wasn't intentional. It was her fault for not looking up the rules herself. Come I'm sorry. I can't think of any reason to be angry. When she uttered those words, Elliot's mouth gaped open in surprise for some reason. And that baffled words continued as she wondering if she had said something so strange. As long as I can play chess, I'm fine with it. Monica placed the remaining pieces on the board and faced Elliot. I'm looking forward to having a nice game. All expression disappeared from Monica's face. Her young face showed no sign of fear, and her quiet, calm eyes awaited Elliot's first move. Elliot exhaled slowly and put his hand on the white pawn. Then. I won't hold back anything, that will make things better, huh? Was that guy not enough for you, it was more fun playing chess with you, Lord Howard, I'm so honored to hear that, for some reason, Elliot was grinning happily, showing his white teeth. V7C3, Azareth GT Silent Witch July 25, 2021 9 minutes, this is a story about Elliot Howard the eldest son of Count Dursvi when he was only six years old. It was when Elliot's father took him to visit the Duke of Crockford's household, and there, he met. Was about the same age as Elliot, but he was physically weak and had left the castle to recuperate at his grandfather's house. For that reason, Elliot was brought to the house to be his playmate. But the sight of made Elliot uncomfortable. Just like his small body, his mind was timid. His swordsmanship and horsemanship were terrible as well. Sucked at ballroom dancing, had a poor memory, and was bad at studies. No matter what he did, all of them would end up bad. In addition, he could not speak well in front of others and would bite his tongue easily. In fact, his servant was much more dignified in his behavior and speech than him. How hard it is to be the master of such a useless little fellow, Elliot thought even secretly feeling pity for his servant. More than anything, Elliot was annoyed at the thought that the incompetent might eventually rule over them. So, at that time, Elliot ridiculed and mocked in the typical six-year-old boy way of being mean. Each time he did, would hang his head down sadly and said, Come I'm sorry I couldn't do it properly, how miserable he was. For someone who held a much, much higher position than Elliot. Sooner or later, he would have to lead people. But, despite having less ability than others, there was one thing that he knew a lot about. That was astronomy. Though astronomy would be useless in the future, S. eyes would sparkle when he talked about the stars and read astronomy books in his spare time. So, Elliot secretly hid S. cherished astronomy book in a tree behind the eyes of adults and followers. Sure enough, broke into half a cry and clung to Elliot, begging him to give his book back. Look, it's up in that tree over there. They aren't that tall, so it should be easy for you to get them, right? Grew pale as he looked up at the tree. 
the boy, with his poor physical skills, could not possibly climb the tree on his own. Knowing this, Elliot grinned and egged the boy on. Are you going to cry to your servant again, like you always do? Or do you want to ask an adult for help and said you can't do it by yourself? Stood looking up at the tree intensely but eventually bit his lip tightly before starting to climb the tree. However, his limbs were not moving properly. After just a little bit of climbing, began to quiver and become motionless. What a wimp, when Elliot muttered those words, S trembling hand reached out for a branch, but he failed to grasp it, and ended up falling down. Elliot remained silent and watched that scene because it wasn't much of a height, but he noticed something strange when the fell to the ground. Fearfully approaching, he saw a sharp branch stuck in the side of the branch that had dropped on the spot where he had fallen had stabbed him, and a red stain was slowly spreading around the spot where the branch had pierced S's side. Elliot screamed as he turned pale and called out the grown-ups. Do you realize what you've done? After saying that, his father punched Elliot in the cheek. Elliot made no excuses. He knew the whole accident was caused by his own thoughtless act. The injuries on were not very deep and not life-threatening. However, it was still an injury that required several stitches. You have given him a scar that will last a lifetime. No amount of your life can atone for that crime. Having said that, his father was ready to give up his own head. But then, who had just received medical attention, barged in. Please wait, supported by his servant, stood on his own feet. Naturally, since he had just finished his suturing surgery a while ago, his complexion was pale, and he was sweating profusely. Elliot was not at fault, it was me who messed around and climbed the tree. Elliot was even trying to stop me and risked his life to protect me, bullshit. At the moment fell, Elliot was watching that scene with a smirk on his face. He thought for sure that fall would not injure him. Even then, had covered Elliot, allowing him to get away scot-free and made his father manage to keep his head as well. Later on, Elliot barged into S room and asked. Why did you cover me? That accident was my fault. Wasn't it it even made you injured badly because of me? While Elliot wondered doubtfully if he was trying to curry favor with him, gave a bitter face and said. Dot. The reason I fell out of the tree was that I wasn't good enough at climbing trees. Therefore, it was my fault and I couldn't think of any reason to blame you. His tone sounded almost as if he took it for granted. His face seriously implied that it was his fault for not being able to climb the tree properly. Come then, once that injury is healed, I'll teach you how to climb a tree. As soon as Elliot mentioned that in a whisper, S light blue eyes sparkled. Really? I'm so happy. I've been thinking for a while how much better the stars would look from up in the trees. The smiling face of who said that showed how truly happy he was from the bottom of his heart. The words of Monica Norton, which overlapped with the words of that boy, abruptly brought back memories of the past. When Elliot asked her why she was not blaming him, Monica said, Come I'm sorry. I can't think of any reason to be angry. Why did she not tell him that it was his fault for not explaining the rules? Just like the boy at that time who said that with the same face. Ah, now I understand. I guess that's probably why I've always been drawn to Miss Norton. While thinking about this in the corner of his mind, Elliot moved the white bishop. And Monica played her next move without pause. Same as before, Monica played her pieces unusually fast since Monica rarely took a long time to think. When Elliot moved a piece, she immediately made the next move. Eventually, when Monica moved the black queen, the game was over. Elliot stared at the board then opened his mouth. Comma stalemate. Huh. Elliot didn't give her a handicap this time. In fact, he got the first one to move, but against a girl who had only played chess a few times before the game ended up in a draw. And now, that girl was staring at the board without any expression of regret or happiness on her face. She was probably analyzing the game she had just played. You know. 
Playing chess can show one's personality. A. At Elliot's murmur, Monica blinked at him. Elliot scrutinized his droopy eyes in response and shrugged lightly. You see, in Cyril's case his chess style is very simple, protect the king. He's what we call a hard defensive type. But you are the opposite, strictly speaking, Monica's chess style was somewhat different from aggressive. To put it simply, it was thorough, logical, and efficient. Maybe you would even use the king as bait to win, to Monica Norton. King's pieces and pawn's pieces have equal value. For this reason, she can sacrifice any piece without hesitation if it will increase her chances of winning, even a little. Comma that's exactly why her methods were so merciless and cruelly strong. While the current game ended in a draw, Monica had only played three chess matches under her belt and this was her third time. Should Monica gain further experience and learn to play the game? she would become a fearsome monster. Such a premonition sent a shiver down Elliot's spine. Despite her overwhelming talent that even Felix can't measure, she has a shy and demeaning personality, that imbalance was simply too unsettling. He was observing Monica closely when she opened her small mouth. Commas for your chess, Lord Howard, oh. An amateur tries to talk about my chess, you seem to be fixated on the rank of the pawn. Elliot's eyebrows arched in a twitch. What Monica pointed out was something that had been said to him before by his teacher. Elliot's style of chess was overly fixated on the rank of the pieces. The queen should be played like a queen, and the pawn should be played like a pawn, in a formation where the higher ranking pieces should be put to use. In a sense, it could be called chess as opposed to Monica, who did not find any difference in its value as a piece. Pointing at Elliot's lined pawn, Monica said. In this game, there were moments when your pawn could be promoted, a pawn that reaches the far end of the enemy line can become a queen or other piece. But you did not opt for promotion, which was the best move at that time, Elliot secretly marveled at how she had noticed. Indeed, Elliot always tried his best to avoid a promotion move. Comma I don't like the rule of promotion. Elliot pinched one of White's pawns and placed it back in his own board. Soldiers who can reach the farthest end of the enemy lines can get promoted. That rule was something Elliot hated to death. I had an uncle who fell in love with a commoner and made her his wife. He said she was a pure and kind-hearted woman. However, she ended up embezzling my uncle's money. Felt betrayed, my uncle, hanged himself off. The person who first found his uncle hanging from the ceiling, swaying, was Elliot, who had come to learn chess from him. Almost all the money was gone from his uncle's house. When the wife, a former commoner, heard of his uncle's death, she seized all the money and ran away, without warning the man who had driven her husband to suicide. Do you get it now? A commoner should act like a commoner, and a noble should act like a noble. If you overstep the bounds of your status, there will always be someone who would be suffering misfortunes. That's why Elliot detested commoners who didn't know their place in society. When he saw someone risen to a high position, he felt repulsed. At first, Elliot felt the same way about Monica. Despite being a commoner, Monica Norton enrolled in Serendia Academy and became a member of the Student Council. And such Monica was an eyesore for Elliot, up until now. I guess sometimes there are some people, who have an overwhelming talent that transcends the boundaries of their status. The question of where to place such a person remained unanswered for Elliot. So, with a bitter look on his face, he decided to give her a word of advice. Come Miss Norton, I will hold off for the time being on what your evaluation is and where your standing is. Oh okay, but I have a word of advice. A commoner born with exceptional talent is often envied by the incompetent or taken advantage of by the cunning. I know one person who had his life ruined that way. Elliot's words made Monica's face grow pale and tense. You have to be careful how you conduct yourself. I'm sure you're going to be in the spotlight a lot from now on. A. Elliot wordlessly gestured at the blackboard to a puzzled Monica. 
Professor Boyd was writing something on it. Chess tournament, selected participants, front player, Monica Norton middle player, Benjamin Molding captain, Elliot Howard Monica's face went white right down to her lips. Che. Che chess tournament, on the last day off, four days before the school festival, we're going to invite representatives from other schools to join us for a chess tournament. I assume you see those events in the budget proposal. B B B B B but. W Y me, as Monica's eyes widened to their limit, shaking uncontrollably, Professor Boyd strode up to Monica's side. He, a big skinhead with the dignity of having been through many battles, tapped Monica on the shoulder with a hand so big that it could have easily crushed her face. Then, in a low voice with no expression, he left a few words. I'm counting on you, I ka 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 ka, probably wanting to say, I can't, Elliot shrugged his shoulders and told Monica. Well, just take it easy, Miss Norton, Monica was still convulsing while repeating the same words, I ka 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 ka. Her consciousness must have been gone by half. V7C4, Monica's request as a GT silent witch July 27th. 2021 six minutes after school, Felix was busy working in the student council room, while Elliot and Monica were heading there almost at the same time. It seemed that they had been selected to be part of the chess tournament, and had a brief conversation with Professor Boyd about it. Everybody but Felix had just left the student council room. With the school festival coming up, they were busy dealing with outside parties and meeting with the heads of the various departments. On the other hand, Felix had a little more time on his hands since he was just waiting for the report. Just then, he heard some good news. Elliot and Monica had been selected to be part of the chess tournament. Felix smiled at them. Glad to hear that two of our student council members have been chosen again this year. Good luck in representing the school. I'll reduce your workload a bit until the upcoming chess tournament is over, Fa. Thank, you, with the school festival just around the corner, the student council members were naturally very busy, but Monica always finished her work quickly, and Bridget, who shared Elliot's position as secretary, will be able to cover for him. Bridget, the secretary, although talented in her own right, proved to be quite adept at working with people. Her ability to keep the department heads, committees and club representatives on track was almost endearing. Right now, the busiest person was definitely Neil, the general affairs manager. Felix has been following up on Neil's work, but it might be better to have Cyril help him as well. Up until now, Cyril had been assigned as Monica's trainer, but once the chess tournament is over, it should be no problem to remove Cyril from that role. Felix glanced at Monica and Elliot as he contemplated the work arrangements. Monica remained as usual, awkwardly downcast, fidgeting and kneading her fingers. However, the mood of Elliot standing next to her seemed to be much less spiky. Elliot was not pleased with the idea of Monica, a commoner, becoming a member of the student council, but his attitude has softened a bit recently. Cyril's attitude has changed recently. And now Elliot too, has something happened between them and the little squirrel that I'm not aware of? In Elliot's case, it was probably about the chess class. Felix originally wanted to recommend a practical magic class to Monica, but she chose to take a chess class. If only he had been a year behind, he would have been able to play chess with her, he thought, secretly disappointed. After all, he had taken a chess class last year. How strong is the little squirrel from your point of view, Elliot? Pretty impressive. Despite only having played three times as a beginner, I was dragged into a stalemate. Oh, Elliot was strong enough to be chosen as the captain of the team. It would be worthy of praise if she could get a draw against him. Felix suddenly thought of something, took out a chessboard and a set of pieces from the cabinet, and then turned his head at Monica. How about playing a match with me? It never hurts to play against a variety of opponents when competing in chess tournaments. I I I I I I wouldn't dare. I I don't want to interfere. 
with your work, your highness, I have some free time right now. Right, if you beat me, I will listen to one of your requests, anything. Monica's round eyes widened at Felix's proposal. Her normally dark and shadowy brown eyes reflected the light diffusely, glittering with the color of young leaves. A anything, yeah, nodding, Felix secretly felt a surge of excitement in his heart. Usually, Monica would never ask for anything from anyone. She was the kind of girl who would squirm apologetically even just to borrow a quill. Now such a Monica will ask a favor from him. What exactly will this little squirrel be asking Felix for? Maybe a mathematical book? It could very well be, but if it really was, so be it. After all, how could you not want to reward a cute little animal when it's begging for something? Felix recalled the scene where Monica was drinking chocolate with Cyril not long ago. Lately, his favorite little squirrel seemed to be quite attached to Cyril. Before he knew it, the way she called him had changed from Lord Ashley to Lord Cyril. But she still addressed Felix as your highness. All in all, he was sulking over the fact that his favorite pet was fond of someone other than him. Well, if all she wants is a mathematical book, so be it. It might be fun to surprise the little squirrel by presenting her with an extremely rare book. With this idea in mind, Felix arranged his pieces. Now, he had to lose cleverly without Elliot and Monica noticing. It's checkmate. Felix secretly smiled at the board as he listened to Monica's declaration. Hmm. He did cut a few corners, but Monica won the game outright. Perhaps there was no reason to cut corners in this match. I was planning on making it a little more of a close game, but, oh well. It was going to be a losing game anyway. While Felix was thinking about this, Elliot, who had been watching this one-sided and overwhelming game, glared at Monica with twitching cheeks. Comma I just realized, Miss Norton, you went easy on me during our match at lunch, didn't you? At Elliot's words, Monica was taken aback and shook her head. N -n 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 no, I don't, I, never went easy on you. Monica desperately denied Elliot's claims, then. I did all I could to make it a stalemate. She blew herself up. I knew it, you were aiming for a draw from the start, and did you know what that is? They called it holding back, Elliot grunted in a low voice and pinched Monica's right cheek. The soft cheek of Monica stretched further than he expected. With a pinch on her cheek, Monica gave a gagging, sobbing excuse. I only wanted to test a pattern for becoming a stalemate EA, so you used me as a test subject. Now I'm pissed. I'm going to tell Professor Boyd to swap out the captain for the front player, Nua. I'm so I I I I I I. The scene of Elliot pinching Monica's cheeks as she whimpered bitterly gave Felix the familiar look of that brat. Although Elliot was now obsessed with maintaining the integrity of nobility. Felix knew that he used to be quite a rascal. They're so lively, really. Felix laughed as he looked at Elliot, who looked strangely happy despite his anger. Secretary Howard, please spare her at that. You'll stretch the little squirrel's cheek pouch out. Monica rubbed her reddened cheeks as she sniffled when Elliot pulled his hand away from her cheek with a look of dejection on his face. So, what does the little squirrel want to ask me for? I. Can ask anything, can't I? Of course. Monica clenched her fists tensely as Felix nodded approvingly. I wish, you'd stop, calling me little squirrel. Felix silently reached out with a smiling, gentle smile and pinched Monica's left cheek, which was still white. Why I I I I, wow, it stretches really well. Yeah, this is going to be a bit of a habit, I H H hers, it hurts, oh. I apologize, Monica, when Felix quickly pulled his hand away, Monica stroked her cheeks on both sides, sobbing miserably, then opening her eyes to the limit, and looked at Felix. Just now, you called me, M.M. What's the matter, Monica? Monica's cheeks were red and swollen, but she managed to turn them back to normal when Felix smiled at her. At, at least, like everyone else, I mean. 
like Miss Norton or Treasurer Norton. I assume your request is to stop calling me Little Squirrel? But I don't recall it stating anything about how I call. Monica finally stopped twitching at Felix's nonchalant reply. At this moment, in Monica's mind, there was Barrier Magician, with a bad personality laughing, although Felix had no way of knowing. Kama ha hold up. This is what happens when you don't set strict conditions. This was what it meant to win the fight and lose the war, Monica thought as she cried in her heart. V7C5, Musicians Chess Azareth GT Silent Witch July 29, 2021 5 minutes Benjamin Molding, a third-year high school student who took part as a second player for Sarandia Academy in a chess tournament, was the son of a court musician. He has been studying music since childhood, doing everything from playing to composing music, and apparently, he already has fans in the high social circle. With straight, flaxen head let down down to his shoulders, Benjamin was a young man with a delicate, ephemeral appearance. Indeed, he was an ephemeral young man. Chess is like music. The game record is like the musical score. If you look at the game record, if you play one game, you can see the musical aspect in your opponent's chess. Forte. Forte. Sforzando. Sforzando. Some chess games are very aggressive, while others have a solemnity like a classical piece. Elliot's chess is like a marching march. A disciplined military style of Alamarca, possessing unconventional beauty and strength. Yes. Just listen and you will hear it the sound of the trumpet announcing the beginning of the war. The noise of horsemen kicking the ground. Monica seriously wondered when Benjamin was catching his breath, as his face turned red with spill flying from his mouth. Elliot, standing beside him, shrugged his shoulders with a weary look on his face. Well, he's a bit of an artist. Anyway, it's a long story, oh okay, you might as well just ignore it. Regardless of whether he heard Elliot's voice or not, Benjamin moved his thin, delicate fingers as if he were waving a conductor's stick, staring at the board with ecstatic eyes. The board represented the end of the game between Monica and Benjamin. Miss Norton's chess is like a symphony played by an orchestra. Each note from the beginning to the end of the piece is meticulously calculated in the score. The magnificent and majestic melody created by the perfect harmony of all the instruments is the culmination of a musician's soul. It is no exaggeration to say that this is a miraculous score bestowed upon us by the god of music. In other words, what I'm trying to say is, facing Monica, Benjamin patted her on the thin shoulder and said, You're the captain. Keep up the good work, I think so, too, in agreement with Benjamin's words. Elliot concurred easily. Monica squealed, cowering with her head in her hands. And no, that's too muwak. Until the day of the chess tournament, the chosen students stayed behind after school and played chess incessantly. At the training session, Monica had her first game with the second inline player, Benjamin Molding. Benjamin was chosen as one of the players, which made him a strong opponent. However, Elliot had warned her don't go for a stalemate, so Monica went all out and defeated him. Resulting, the occurrence of the story mentioned earlier. Out of all of us, I'm the weakest. So, it only makes sense if I become the first in-line player, Benjamin stated, folding his arms as if it was only natural. Monica shook her head vigorously. That, that's not true. I am the most novice here, novice or not. The strongest one gets to be the captain. I am not telling lies or being modest. After all, our family motto is, you may lie to debt collectors and your lovers, but you can't lie about music and chess. This was not the kind of family motto that could be said proudly. But Elliot just shrugged his shoulders in exasperation. Apparently, he was used to this kind of exchange. Benjamin waved his finger in the air as if he didn't see Elliot's exasperation in his eyes. Listen, Miss Norton. My chess is music without limits. Sometimes intense, sometimes sad. It can be light, it can be heavy, it can be grand, 
It can be majestic. I can recreate and play any kind of musicality in chess, but that doesn't mean I'm crazy good at chess. Only the last word was delivered with a posed look. Comma, I think, you're strong enough already, so, I'm aware that I'm fairly, moderately, reasonably strong, but not outstandingly strong. However, your strength is genuine. Who could do it if not you? Elliot gave an approving nod, seemingly agreeing with him. At this rate, she will definitely turn herself into a captain. So Monica clung desperately to them and begged. I am begging you, please, the first in-line player position is already terrifying enough, but if you make me captain, a blinding memory of the past came back to Monica's mind. An interview that left her hyperventilating. Enough to make the content of her stomach spill out when rehearsing for a ceremony. If she became a captain, another incident like that might happen all over again. Elliot held a finger to his chin and squinted his droopy eyes as Monica whimpered mournfully. Well, I suppose it will be a bit of a hassle to change the order since Professor Boyd has already submitted our application. I guess we'll just have to go with it, in which case, I will remain as the captain. Elliot played his bangs with a reluctant look. They're expecting a lot of us this year, you know? Especially since Serendia Academy dominated the last tournament, Elliot's words suddenly reminded Monica of Felix's words. Glad to hear that two of our student council members have been chosen again this year. That was what Felix had told Monica and Elliot the other day when they reported to him on becoming players. Um, did any members, of the student council, participate, in the tournament last year? His Highness and General Affairs Manager Maywood did. By the way, His Highness was the second inline player, and General Affairs Manager Maywood was the captain, I see. Monica's eyes peeled back at Elliot's words. Usually, when it comes to this kind of thing, the captain who was third in line was the most powerful. So she just assumed Felix was the one. Out of all the student council members, the one who seemed far from being the most sharp was Neil, the general affairs manager. Isn't Maywood general affairs manager very thoughtful? I mean, he always knows what I was going to do. Oh okay, that's why in chess, you can do the opposite. At the place where you don't want to be attacked, he will attack you without mercy, and that can be pretty nasty. It was hard to imagine where gentle looking Neil completely blocking his opponent's strategy. As Monica tilted her head, remembering Neil's amiable smile, Benjamin interjected, waving his finger as if he were waving a conducting baton. General Affairs Manager Maywood's chess game seems to be an extremely sophisticated improvisation. The way he reads his opponent's moves and responds perfectly to them is truly amazing. Um, then, what about His Highness's chess? Asking Benjamin in a hushed voice. Monica recalled her game with Felix the other day. Monica had won that game by an overwhelming margin, but Felix didn't seem to be taking it seriously, or other. Felix's chess was the kind of chess where he hadn't revealed all his hands. Elliot's chess showed glimpses of his beliefs, but Felix's chess felt like he was hiding them thoroughly. That's why Monica was curious to know how Benjamin felt about Felix's chess. In response to Monica's question, Benjamin rested his chin on his hand and closed his eyes. It is very difficult to read any trace of musicality from His Highness's chess. But yes, I dare say it may be similar to Miss Norton's chess, a. Benjamin's fingers, which he had been moving like a conductor's rod, stopped in a high, raised position in response to Monica rounded her eyes in surprise. Then. As if lowering the blade of a guillotine, he swung his fingers straight down. Neat and precise, a chess style that involves all possible moves to slaughter the king without fail. And, the strength of the student council member's chess, moderately strong, comma, Cyril, Bridget quite strong, comma, Elliot absurdly strong, comma, Neil, Monica, Felix V7C6. Three most prestigious schools as Earth GT Silent Witch July 31st, 2021 6 minutes Monica, how about we go shopping on the next day off, at a certain day lunchtime, 
A week before the upcoming school festival, Lana suggested that idea. Lana sounded like she has been planning on going shopping to get something she needed for the school festival. In Sarandia Academy, students could go shopping in the nearby town if they filed an out-of-town notification. But as Monica chewed on a piece of bread, she shook her head. I'm sorry, but I had some things to do. On that day, chess tournament, the piece of bread stuck in Monica's throat when Claudia blurted out the words, caused her to choke. While Anna widened her eyes in response, looked at Monica in shock. Do the student council have jobs on the day of the chess tournament? No, I just, Claudia blurted out again, intercepting the stammering Monica. Comma she's become representative player, as a first player, that words almost caused the same thing to happen again, so Monica turned her head at Claudia with tears in her eyes. It's not surprising that few people were aware of the players representing the chess tournament, as they were discreetly posted on the bulletin board. In fact, the chess tournament itself was not a very large-scale event. Even it was called a tournament, but in reality, it's more like a social event where players from other schools were invited. Because of that, very few students had an interest in the chess tournament. Even Lana who stared at her with her eyes wide open, didn't seem to know that Monica had been chosen as a player in the chess tournament. What? Don't tell me you've been chosen as a player, Monica, and more or less, talking about something like getting chosen as a representative always made Monica uncomfortable, so she never told anyone about this. Comma you're getting too carried away, you're only a good for nothing without skills. Those memories of heartless words thrown at her in the past kept running through her head. The mere thought of the cold eyes of that boy Monica had once believed to be her friend was enough to make her heart squeezed, but contrary to her expectation. That's amazing, Lana rattled her chair off, leaned forward to examine the flabbergasted Monica before excitedly rambled on. Oh, my gosh. Why do you keep those things to yourself? Do cheering the match aloud in there, you're planning to do that when you don't even know the chess rules, Lena's lower lip powdered at Claudia's remark. I've learned the name of each piece, or you have no shame, to say understand the rules with that alone, W what's wrong with that, while blushing with embarrassment, Lana looked at Monica whose mouth was opening and closing repeatedly, unsure of what to say, but her fluster state forced her to nod. Yet. I'm happy, to have your support, said Monica in a hushed voice, leaving Claudia's sight in disbelief. Come honestly, that statement could cause the bystander idiots who don't understand the rules to cheer loudly, not even I would do something like that, yelled Lana with her raised eyebrows, before turning her head to Claudia as if she had remembered something. Speaking of which, didn't you participate in last year's tournament? I remember there were also two members from the student council. I'm surprised you remembered, Claudia grunted as her beautiful face contorted in vexation, expressing as if she had been confronted with the mistakes of her past. Right, after Neil said, let's do our best. I can't hold back in my match and accidentally playing it with my all. What a blunder, Miss Claudia Ashley was well versed in many knowledge yet extremely troublesome to handle at the same time. Essentially, she loathed being dependent on by anyone, kept others at a distance with a brooding aura, and made no effort to hide her spiteful attitude to anyone but Neil. Of course, her motivation to participate in the tournament last year was the participation of Neil. I wonder what kind of chess lady Claudia plays. I'd like to have a match with her but I don't think she would agree to my request if I asked her to, probably. According to Elliot, Sarandia Academy had dominated the tournament last year, so Claudia must be very strong. Maybe she should ask Elliot or Benjamin about Claudia's chess. As Monica was engrossed with that thought, something brought to Lana's mind as she suddenly chimed in. Hey, I was wondering. Are the schools we're playing against going to be the same ones this year? I suppose. It was dubbed as a social event for the three most prestigious schools, after all. Seriously? 
Monica's heart jumped with an unpleasant sound at Claudia's words. Speaking of the three most prestigious schools in this Riddle Kingdom, there was the Sarandia Academy, a prestigious school for the children of noble families. The temple under the jurisdiction of the shrine excelled in the field of law. And the last one was the best institute for training magicians. Minerva. That thought was resulting in her fork slipped out of her hand. And a clicking noise was reverberated awfully loud, leaving her heart pounded heavily with her palms wet with sweat. Monica, ah. I'm sorry. Monica hurriedly got out of her chair and tried to pick up the fallen fork, but her fingers were unable to hold it properly. The fork slipped off between her fingers and fell to the floor again. Kama Minerva, an institute for training magicians, is an institution where Monica Everett, the silent witch, once attended. Monica had graduated at the age of 15 after skipping a grade, and most likely, her classmates from that time were still in attendance at Minerva. I'll be fine, I think they don't even remember me. I'm sure. Like Monica always did, she had kept her head down and rarely spoke in public. Even after she had learned the no-chant spell, she mostly stayed in the lab and didn't show up at any conferences or research presentations, so only a few people had memorized Monica's face. I'll be fine, I'll be fine, I'll be fine. Her desperate self-convincing words couldn't stop her body from shaking flashing out the memories of the scornful eyes of the boy she once believed to be her friend. Come you're not my friend. Gasped Monica's throat tightened. Unsure of how to breathe properly, Monica took a series of short, gasping breaths. It was the first sign of hyperventilation. Monica hurriedly pressed her hand over her mouth. Monica, Lana, noticing that something was wrong with Monica got out of her chair and kneeled down beside her. I can't let Lana worried. Even when Monica's face grew pale, her body shaking, she moved her trembling lips. I'm fine, yeah, it's nothing, but your condition didn't look like it's nothing, grunted Lana and grimaced, when Claudia blurted out. Comma do you know anyone in the temple or perhaps? Minerva, looking at you. You seem to have some kind of bad relationship with that person. Monica shook her head furiously as she held her chest. No, you're wrong. Barney's not at fault. It must have been my fault. I was wrong. So it's not a bad relationship or anything. It's all my fault. Every time she saw that nostalgic face in her mind, Monica would blame herself. Otherwise, she felt like he would never forgive her. She felt as if she wasn't even allowed to live. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry I came out of my mountain cabin. I shouldn't have been out in the sunlight. I should have done what Bernie said. Monica, called out Lana in a strong voice as she put her hands on her shoulder. In response, Monica turned her head slowly facing Lana, then with a determined look on her face, Lana told her. Before going to the chess tournament, Get up earlier in the morning and come to my room. You hear me, Monica, you must come, promise me. Monica has a habit to nod unconsciously when someone asked her in an assertive voice. So in response to her reluctant nod, Lana told her, you must come, okay, to remind her about her promise. V7C7, non-flag love triangle. As Earth GT silent which August 2nd. 2021 seven minutes ever since Monica heard that Minerva's students were coming to the chess tournament, she has not been able to sleep well. Waking up on the morning of the competition day was just as terrible, and she woke up just as the sun was rising. The cold voice of the boy whom she believed to be her friend was echoing in the back of her ears. Kama you'd be better off holed up in an isolated mountain cabin. Monica sniffed softly and pulled the blanket over her head. Then, a thud sound came across from the room. She slightly rolled up the edge of the blanket and peered towards the sound. Oh, this should be good, right? There, I've done my turn, what a tricky position. Well, how about this, ugh, gggghhhhh, this is, this is, 
A beautiful woman in a mage uniform and a black hat were sitting together around a chess board on the attic floor. She had assumed that they were playing chess, but instead, she saw black and white pieces alternately stacked high on the chessboard. Nero, the black cat, dexterously held the pieces with his paw and carefully placed them on top of the stacked pieces, but they lost their balance and fell apart. Damn, I knew it, play this game using my cat paw was going to be tough, Nero was tapping the fallen pieces with his paw in frustration, while Louis's contracted spirit, Lynn, was cleaning up the scattered pieces unperturbed. Comma what are you doing, at Monica Inquire, Nero brazenly held up a chess piece and said. We're playing chess, in this game, players play by piling up black and white pieces alternately and whoever makes them collapse loses. Currently, I have won seven games in a row. Realizing this was not the chess game she knew, Monica smiled dryly and got out of bed. Given that Lynn was here, perhaps it was already time to make the usual routine report? As Monica sluggishly getting dressed, Lynn, still cleaning up the chess pieces, spoke. Sir Lewis told me there will be a chess tournament today and a school festival in four days. Since there will be many outsiders coming in and out, he had ordered me to accompany you on guard duty, during the chess exchange matches, all the student council members, except for Monica and Elliot who will be taking part as players, would be in charge to receive students from other schools. Sure enough, with Nero and Lynn guarding Felix. Monica could concentrate on her chess without any worries. Ever since after what had happened in Casey's case, Louis's caution was to be expected. Um. Lynn, yes, after that incident. What happened to Casey? Casey, who had attempted to assassinate Felix, was supposed to be executed, but instead was taken into custody by Louis on the condition, she must explain all the details honestly. But should Casey refuse to be interrogated? Monica, who knows how merciless Lewis can be, couldn't help but felt a shiver. Miss Casey Groove, daughter of Count Bright, complied with the interrogation. In that matters, Sir Lewis has already been in contact with Count Bright in secret. Casey's father, Count Bright, has stated that he was entirely responsible for the incident and has stubbornly denied any connection to the Randall Kingdom. However, Lewis suspected that the Randall Kingdom side was also behind the assassination plan and was investigating the source of the assassination magic tool, the Quonk Flame. Miss Casey Groove has been sent to a convent in the Northeast just the other day. I see. Monica's heart wrenched every time she remembered Casey's sorrowful voice. Casey felt indebted to the Randall Kingdom. So when she discovered that Duke Crockford was planning to invade Randall, she was determined to stop him. Sooner or later, when Felix becomes king, Duke Crockford, Felix's backer, will probably drive Felix to attack the Randall Kingdom and eventually start a war with the Empire. The Empire itself was formidable, but with the recent reign of a young emperor, the regime has been unstable. This had provided him a perfect opportunity to make a move on them. That being said, Monica can't just sit back and watch Felix get assassinated. I don't know which path should I choose. None of each side was completely united. Some work for their personal fortune, some for the national interest, some for their ideals, some for peace, some for further development. A whirlwind of thoughts, ideals, and desires. This is what politics is all about. Even after becoming one of the Seven Sages, Monica kept away from political affairs and secluded herself in her cabin. She firmly believed that staying away from politics was the best thing to do. But things can't be the same anymore. The political struggles that Monica had turned a blind eye to until now were quietly coming to her doorstep. Why does His Highness, who is such an amazing person, always follow Duke Crockford words. Everyone knew Felix was very capable. It was also a well-known fact that he was at the mercy of his maternal grandfather, the Duke of Crockford. Even Monica, who was not familiar with politics, had overheard about it. Horizontal Ellipsis
Does His Highness want to go to war with Randall and the Empire? Is he really fine to let this country be engulfed in a war? Monica still couldn't grasp the person named Felix R. Gridile. Even the same student council members, such as Cyril and Elliot, have shown more of their personalities and ideals compared to their first encounter. For example, Cyril was a proud person who was strict with himself and others. He can be somewhat narrow-minded, but he was caring and attentive to those around him. He took pride in being recognized by Felix and was more devoted to that person than anyone else. Elliot adhered to the status system and had a belief that nobles must act like nobles and commoners must act like commoners. Even his looks gave a frivolous impression, but at heart, was very earnest. And the fact that he felt uncomfortable when used a castling against Monica proved how earnest this person was. Up until now. Monica had always avoided interacting with people, but after she infiltrated Sarandia Academy and came into contact with various people, she gradually began to see things more clearly. Which was, she can naturally understand about a person, once she knew what he she valued the most. Casey wanted to protect her family Elliot took pride in being a nobleman Cyril was devoted to Felix. Everyone has their own values and beliefs and they are all fighting to protect them. Then what about His Highness? What is His Highness fighting to protect? From Monica's standpoint, Felix was calm, friendly, and sociable, but no one knew what he was thinking. But when he said, Whenever I show up at a tea party, no one offers me chocolates made with Randall's techniques. I mean, what's the harm in something that tastes good? The cold look on his face as he blurted out how stupid the power struggle was, she didn't think that words were a lie. I can't let his highness die. I won't let his highness die. For that reason, she had to make sure that both the chess tournament and the school festival four days later were successful. To do that, she needed to make sure to divide her role between Nero and Lynn. Monica turned to face Nero and Lynn. I would like to confirm today's arrangement. Nero, I want you to make sure if there are any suspicious magical reactions similar to the Kwong flame the other day. Lin, as a wind spirit, you should be able to hear sounds from afar, right? Please keep an eye out for any suspicious conversations around His Highness. At Monica's instruction, Nero chimed got it, as he raised his paw proudly. Lynn gave an understood nod and made one statement to Monica. To tell you the truth, I was discussing with Lord Nero how should we protect the second prince without attracting suspicion while playing this game. Oh, I just remembered. Watch me, Monica. Particles of light enveloped Nero and Lynn, changing their appearance. Eventually, the light subsided replaced by two beautiful individuals dressed in Sarandia Academy uniforms. One was a wild-looking handsome man with black hair, the other was an elegant handsome man with short blonde hair. The dark-haired one was Nero, of course, but the blonde guy, perhaps. W what? Ee? -e? Are you by any chance? Lynn, indeed, I am Lewis Miller's contracted spirit, Lind Bergfield. According to a book Monica had once read, spirits have no gender, so when they turn into humans, they can turn into either men or women. Still, witnessing her transformation from a woman to a man was a surprising experience. His frame was slender but definitely that of a grown man, while his voice was lower than usual. What do you think? This way we can walk around the school building without attracting suspicion, next to Nero who looked pleased with himself, Lynn took out a book expressionlessly. There was a scene in this novel where the heroine is tangled up with a bad guy, which ended up to be defended by her classmate by saying, Don't touch my girl art right, if Miss Monica ever gets tangled up, I'll be sure to reenact this scene, so please rest assured and just let the bad guy tangle with you. As Monica stood speechless, Nero's eyes glowed brightly. Oh. That sounds great. I want to do it too. I call this a love triangle between me, Miss Monica, and Lord Nero. What a thrilling development. For Monica, 
This is a thrilling development in a negative way. Monica opened her mouth, putting a hand to her forehead with a pensive look on her face. You know, I think the uniforms you're wearing for someone of that age, would make you stand out even more. W.H. what? I can't believe it. For some reason, both of them did not seem to have an accurate grasp of their own outward age. Both Nero and Lynn looked to be in their mid-twenties when they transformed into humans. Needless to say, they were suspicious people wearing uniforms. After Monica brought it up, they exchanged glances and began discussing strategies, such as what to wear, or what not to wear. In the first place, Nero can turn into a cat and Lynn can turn into a bird. There's no need for them to transform into humans. Regardless of what Monica said, they were still arguing about what to wear, so she decided to leave them alone and leave the room. She had promised Lana to visit her room today. She didn't have much time to relax. V7C8, a torture device, no matter how you look at it. As Earth GT silent which August 4, 2021 7 minutes feeling uncertain about the future of this country, the pressure of guarding Felix, and the fear of meeting the nervous people, Monica visited Lana's room, and now, she being constricted by Lana. Uuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuu
makeup didn't suddenly make her into a beautiful woman whom everyone would turn to. The image in the mirror was of a simple-looking girl with round eyes, a small nose, and a small mouth. But if they saw Monica now, no one would mistake her for a child in her early teens. If anything, Monica, who always had an unhealthy complexion, looked healthier and brighter now. That alone was enough to shock her. I I look like, 17, was that the impression you should have to say right now? Also, I look so healthy, so you were aware that you looked unhealthy? You better improve your diet and sleep, you hear me. Although Lana sounded taken aback, she seemed satisfied with the quality of Monica's makeup. Lana let out a triumphant snort and instructed the maidservant, bring me that thing. She thought her current appearance was already nice enough, so she was wondering what kind of stuff she would bring in. While Monica was impressed by her reflection in the mirror, a maid behind her brought out some unfamiliar metal equipment. To Monica, who had no idea what it was for, it looked like a torture device. But then the maidservant started to roast it over a fire. La Lana, WH what kind of torture device is that? You think this is a torture device? Jeez. It's called a hair straightener, and not branding iron. When it comes to iron that was roasted over a fire, the image that comes to her mind was that of the branding iron used to brand livestock. When Monica shivered thinking about getting that thing on her skin, Lana gave her a half-hearted look. Comma I don't know what you are imagining, but, this is for curling hair, curling, hair. Monica, who had never heard of the culture of curling hair, could only make blank stares. Lana picked up the hair straightener and then faced Monica's hair. Well then, this is just the beginning. From now on, don't move your head even a slightly. It was the morning of the chess tournament, and the student council members were ordered to come a little earlier to prepare for the arrival of the students from other schools. As soon as Monica stepped into the specified meeting room, the rest of the student council members saw her and their expressions changed. Everyone was looking at Monica, who was different from the norm. They were like oh, which princess is this beautiful girl, though, it's not the case. Come Miss Norton, your appearance looks like a 17 girl, that was all Elliot managed to say. Some people might take offense at the rudeness of this line. But Monica nodded enthusiastically with a twinkle in her eyes. D did I look like, 17, years old, yeah, that's a surprise. What's with all the makeup and hairstyle, and my friend arranged it for me. Did I really look like 17 years old, yeah, you sure looked like a 17 years old girl. Elliot's crude speech made Monica squirm with excitement. For Monica who has always been told that she looks like a child and has a baby face. The phrase you looked like XXX years old was the best compliment she ever received. Now Monica was wearing a corset to correct her hunched back, applying makeup to brighten her complexion, and curling the ends of her light brown hair into a slight curl. Though her hair was adorned with the usual ribbons and not particularly flashy, the curly hair gave her a much different impression. The current Monica was like a normal, healthy 17-year-old girl who could be found anywhere. The sad thing was, to the surprise of those around her, the usual Monica was a girl with an unhealthy complexion. Cyril Ashley's eyes widened in amazement and muttered rude things such as I didn't know your face was looked like that. He had probably identified Monica only by her features as a skinny little girl with light brown hair as she always kept her head down intended to conceal her eyes. Neil honestly said, Wow, you look wonderful, and Bridget, who was generally harsh with Monica, only commented, You should do that much normally, as Monica squirmed with excitement. Felix, who was standing in front of her, Gently brushed aside a strand of Monica's hair and parted his lips. You look so lovely today. You are usually adorable, but today you are very beautiful. A butterfly might be tempted to rest its wings on a beautiful blossoming bud that had been closed tightly. Monica's thoughts paused for a few seconds. Her brain, which was not used to this kind of expression, took a very long time to understand the poetic and literary phrases. 
So, Monica decided to ask straight away. Comma then, did I look like, 17, years old, yeah, you did, mmmmmm. Felix was muttering you were more pleased with that compliment, hurt to himself when he saw Monica was squirming in delight. Monica has never been interested in fashion. In fact, it would be fair to say that she was indifferent to it. For her, who has been hiding away in her cabin without seeing anyone, being fashionable was something unnecessary. However, ever since she came to Serendia Academy and Lana taught her how to braid hair, Monica's consciousness had started to change, if only slightly. At least, to the extent that she was concerned about Claudia calling her a toddler, it is about time, your highness. I think you should leave it at that, Bridget chimed in, casting her eyes over her watch. Felix reluctantly withdrew his hand from Monica's face and then gave instructions to all the student council members. Well then, I guess it's about time we welcome the students from Temple and Minerva. The mention of the name of the institute she had once attended brought Monica back to her senses. It'll be fine, I'm sure it'll be fine, as long as I keep my posture good and keep my composure, they won't notice me unless things go horribly wrong. Barney, Barney, what are those people doing? Oh, they are playing chess. It could be categorized as a board game, a game for those with too much spare time in their hands, Barney snickered mockingly looked at the people of the chess club from a distance. They came to Minerva to study magic, but then creating a chess club, it's beyond ludicrous. We are at the pinnacle of a magician training institution, so shouldn't we be concentrating on studying magic? That's what Barney had said when Monica was still attending at Minerva. And because of that reason, somewhere in the back of her mind, Monica had assumed that Barney would never take a part in chess, but. Nice to meet you. I'm Barney Jones, president of the Minerva Chess Club. The sight of the bespectacled young man shaking hands with Felix had left Monica speechless. His height was taller and his voice was lower from what she had remembered, but, she would never have mistaken him for someone else. Why, why are you here? Standing at the head of Minerva students was a man who had once been Monica's best friend. Why are you here? Barney? V7C9, non-flag love triangle, returns the beauty of love triangle for Mazareth GT silent which August 6, 2021 10 minutes the people from Minerva and the academy who came to visit Serendia Academy were consisting of three male students and a teacher, four people each. The temple students had their hair cut short, giving out the image of serious students which was embodied the strict culture of the school. The teacher leading them was a man with black hair cropped short and sharp eyes in his mid-forties. On the other hand, Minerva students, including their captain, Barney Jones, were all boys with a scholarly air about them, which was led by a young male teacher with a somewhat unreliable appearance. Apart from Barney, Monica had never met any of the other students or the teacher who was leading them. Perhaps the teacher had been assigned to the school after Monica had graduated. So, that leaves only one person here who knew about Monica Everett of the Silent Witch. And that was. Hi, I'm Barney Jones. Nice to meet you, I'm Monica Norton. The representative from each school exchanged their greeting with each other. Monica had been paying attention to Barney's movements, but his attitude had not changed in any particular way. He probably hasn't noticed that Monica was here. It was thanks to Lana's makeup. Also, I need to maintain my posture and facial expressions. Posture and facial expressions. It was difficult for her to smile as naturally as the others, but she kept her lips tight and straightened her back so as not to appear nervous. Thanks to the corset, she felt much taller than usual, with a straighter spine. Claiming that she had become a different person than usual would be an exaggeration to say, but the makeup that Lana applied helped to give Monica a little more courage. It's alright, it'll be fine. He hasn't noticed me. As Monica was desperately convincing herself, Dan Redding, the teacher from Temple, observed the people from Serendia Academy then opened his mouth. 
Comma, I suppose this year's representatives was different from last year's. Despite his stern face, his tone was polite, and Boyd, the teacher with the mercenary-like face from the Serendia Academy side, nodded heavily. We change our representative every year. I've been looking forward to competing with the last year's students Serendia Academy since they were very strong. Don't you think so too, Sir Pittman? A teacher from Minerva called Pittman seemed to be in a bit of a daze. After being called out repeatedly by Redding, he suddenly gave a smile and responded. Ah, yes, that's right. Yet, from the looks of it, Redding from Temple seemed to be a rigid person, while Pittman from Minerva was to be a rather airhead person. As the two teachers gave compliments to last year's students from Serendia Academy, Boyd, the representative of Serendia Academy, made a short declaration in a low voice that seemed to echo from the depths of the earth. Our student this year is strong, Boyd may not be a teacher of many words, but his short words always carried weight. Redding's face tensed up just a little. Pittman, though, was still airhead as ever. Comma yeah, I'm looking forward again to this year's tournament, oh, please be easy on me. The match hadn't started yet, but the teachers were already igniting the sparks way before the students could. While the chess tournament may be called an exchange event between the three schools, it was also an opportunity for the three most prestigious schools to compete with each other for the top spot. In the past, the Temple side had set a record for consecutive victories, but after Serendia Academy's overwhelming victory last year, they seemed to be particularly on edge. Redding glanced at Monica and narrowed his eyes slightly. So Serendia Academy got a female student as a representative again this year? Well, Miss Ashley was a very strong player last year. And, Miss Norton, was it? I hope your skills were up to our expectations. The sudden attention made Monica's shoulders jolt. By far, there were fewer women chess players than men. Even more so when it comes to representing their school. The sole fact that Monica was a female student was enough to attract the attention of the people around her. Monica went stiff, cupping both her hands tightly in front of her body when Boyd tapped her shoulder with his large hand. She's a promising newcomer, I'm looking forward to it. Very much, she thought she saw sparks fly between Boyd and Redding. Maintaining her posture and expression. Monica began to calculate pie in her head. You sure are getting a lot of attention, Miss Norton. Elliot made a light-hearted remark to Monica, perhaps trying to lighten the mood. But Monica was far from listening to Elliot's snide remarks. Hey, Miss Norton? Hey, Elliot waved his hand fluttering in front of Monica, but of course, she didn't hear him. 2847565684823378678316783165271201909145648566692 Oh crap this is just like with the accounting as Elliot shook while placed his hand on his forehead Monica continuously recited pi with her back straight tensely just as the people around her began to look at Monica strangely Benjamin Moulding, middle player from Serendia Academy, raised his voice. Have no worry. The trio Grazioso, Grace, performed by our Serendia Academy will surely capture all of your hearts. If the superb piano is Miss Norton, and the light violin is Elliot, then I am a cellist with the ability to change and shake the hearts of those who listen. Oh, I can hear it, I can hear it. The emotional clamor of the audience whose souls have been shaken by our musical chess, with Monica trapped in the world of numbers, and Benjamin trapped in the world of music. Elliot, who sandwiched between the two of them, wore a face full of fatigue even before the match had started, then looked up at Boyd. Come and now I finally understand why you chose me as the captain, Professor Boyd. In other words, it was an unlucky role in taking care of them. While Monica continued to recite Pi, the captains of each school drew lots to determine the matchups. The first match will be held in the morning, Sarandia Academy vs. Temple. 
The second match will be held after lunch, Minerva vs Sarandia Academy. The third match will be held after a short break, Temple vs Minerva. The match against Minerva where Barney was, would be held after lunch. Now Barney was the captain of Minerva, he would not be able to match up against Monica, the front player. Following the opening speech, the first match will begin after a short break. Before the match started, Monica left the waiting room and went to the makeup room where the mirror was set up. She was slightly worried whether her hair, which Lana had tied up for her, was still in good form. Serendia Academy has a large number of young ladies from noble families, so they had many makeup rooms for use. Monica jogged to the nearest makeup room. After making sure her hair and makeup were intact, she stared straight at the reflection in the mirror. She saw a 17-year-old girl with a healthy complexion. She has a mirror in the cabin where she used to live. It was brought in by Lewis Miller, who could not stand the sight of Monica's appearance, and pestered, you should be a little more mindful about your appearance. However, she rarely used that mirror. Because she had no interest in getting dressed and thought she could just wear a hood when she went out in public. But now, I think I understand why Lewis told me to be mindful of my appearance. In the world of society, appearance was one of its weapons. This has been proved in the case of Felix and Bridget. And being well-dressed was like being well-armed. With that in mind, the corset she wore started to feel like armor. At first, she hated it because it was so tight, but now it made her felt reassured. Facing the mirror, Monica whispered to herself, Why you can do it, though she felt a little embarrassed to say her resolution out loud, it gave her a sense of courage nevertheless. After feeling convinced with herself, she left the makeup room. There were still a few minutes left before the first game started, but it would be better to return early. As she hurriedly walked down the hallway, she caught sight of a figure turning the corner of the hallway ahead of her. The moment she saw that figure, Monica's legs cowered. Pardon me, Miss Monica Norton, blonde hair with a slight quirk, nostalgic glasses and the neatly dressed Minerva uniform. The person who stopped Monica was her former best friend, Barney Jones. Monica gulped. What kind of response would be the most appropriate here? If she spoke carelessly, she felt like her secrets will be exposed. The best thing to do would be to say, I'm in a hurry, and walk by. And yet, when Barney spoke to her for the first time in a long time, the nostalgia and the sadness were filling up inside her heart, causing her tracks to stop. Even after being shunned so harshly, Monica was still happy to hear Barney talking to her. Can I have a moment? Monica kept her mouth shut and gave a small nod. It will be fine, I'm sure he hasn't found out yet, she tried to convince herself so. I was surprised when I saw you. You looked like an old acquaintance I used to know. Coincidentally, you even shared the same name, an old acquaintance, I knew you wouldn't call me your friend anymore, Monica thought, secretly disappointed and surprised at how discouraged she was. She realized how much she still wanted to be friends with Barney, even though he hated her so much. By the way, Miss Norton, have you been attending Sarandia Academy last year, if she nodded here, sooner or later? her lie would be exposed. But if she shook her head, she might just solidify Barney's suspicions. Whether she should answer or not, this situation made Monica hesitate. And that hesitation had caused a fatal mistake. Is there some circumstances you can't give me an answer? Before she knew it, Barney had closed the distance between himself and Monica. When he stood closer, she realized how much taller Barney had become. In the past, she only needed to raise her eyes a little to make eye contact. Now she has to tilt her head upward to see his face. The sharp eyes behind the glasses were coldly cornering Monica, who took a step back, then rapidly closing the distance, to not let her get away. What should I do? What should I do? What should I do? Monica clasped her hands together in front of her chest as she trembled. 
Her frightened demeanor made Barney's eyes grow colder and colder. He's angry, for sure. I have to apologize, I have to ask him to forgive me. Just as Monica was about to utter an apology with her trembling lisp, someone pulled her tightly back against him. Hey, don't you dare touch my girl. Hugging Monica's waist was a dark-haired young man in a gorgeous formal dress. Enero? Why is he wearing a formal dress, and why did he have to reenact the thing from this morning at this point in time? As Monica was lost in thought, another slumping weight fell on her other shoulder. Slightly moving her eyes, she saw a beautiful blonde-haired man wearing a formal dress as glamorous as Nero's, Lynn, holding Monica's shoulder. Don't you dare touch my woman, boy, his dialogue overlaps with Nero's. Monica's eyes widened to their limit as her mouth gaped. However, Barney was probably more surprised than her. After all, out of nowhere, two flamboyantly dressed men appeared and interrupted them. W who are you two, I wonder who are they, really, Monica thought. Of course, she didn't have the guts to say it out loud. Nevertheless, the fact that both Nero and Lynn seemed to be enjoying themselves with such vivacity was also a real headache. Nero, for example, has a twinkle in his eye. He wasn't rushing in here because he was worried about Monica, but to enjoy this situation. To top it all off, Lynn declared to Barney with a very serious face. I might find a love triangle form is beautiful, but a love square is a bit too much for me personally so I'm afraid I must ask you to leave it, talk about a wild argument. However, whether pressured by the strange momentum or feeling ridiculous, Barney retreated snidely and lifted his misplaced glasses with his fingertips. Comma sorry for bothering you before the match. With that, Barney turned his back on Monica and walked away. After confirming Barney was no longer in sight, Monica slumped to the spot. Well. Did you see my great performance? You can fall in love with me, Monica. I feel like I've accomplished my entire mission for the day with this one performance. Looking up at the satisfied Nero and Lynn, Monica asked in a deadpan voice. Come um, you two, what are you wearing? The clothes that Nero and Lynn were wearing were gorgeous enough to indicate that they were going to an evening party. It was no longer the level of being out of place. To Monica's remark, Lynn replied with great seriousness. Yesterday, you pointed out that it was too unnatural for us to wear uniforms with our appearance, so we decided to have some improvements, improvements, when Monica muttered in a hollow voice, Lynn nodded curtly. The idea was to create a couple of excited cheerful boys who wore formal wear even though the school festival hadn't started yet it was such a perfect disguise, right? Both Lynn and Nero acted as if nothing was wrong. Sandwiched between the two glittering handsome men, Monica couldn't help but cover her face with her hands. Comma you know, both of you. I'm grateful you've come to help me, but please, please, I'm really, really, really begging you, please stay in your cat and bird forms. Monica was regretting her decision to not press the two of them this morning, as much as she was dying to do so. V7C10, an overwhelming strength Azeroth GT Silent Witch August 8, 2021 6 minutes The chess tournament was held in the dance hall of Serendia Academy. Even though three representatives from each school would be playing at the same time, the dance hall, which was far too large, was chosen as the venue to provide seating for the spectators. The spectator seats are set up at a certain distance from the players to no interrupt their concentration. However, as the distance was too great for the spectators to see the match, the student council had prepared three large boards to resemble a chessboard. Pins that looked like pieces were fastened to these boards to show the situation of the game in real time. Third-year students taking an elective chess class at Serendia Academy took turns managing the board and hosting the games. While both teachers and student council members were watching the game from separate seats, as were the rest of the spectators. Let me inform you, this year's temple is strong. After all, we've got an excellent newcomer from a neighboring country, 
who came all the way to study at the temple to pursue chess studies. Among the students from the neighboring country of Randall, he is said to be an unbeatable chess player, as Redding, the teacher from Temple rambles on, Pittman, the teacher from Minerva, seated next to him, softly chimes in. Coming all the way from a neighboring country to study in Temple? Now that's amazing, indeed, practically he's a very talented student, but he's a little hard-headed, you see. I have intended to make him captain of the team but he stubbornly insists on becoming the front player because he is a newcomer. Well, I feel a little sorry for the front player of Minerva and Sarandia Academy. Redding didn't look very apologetic. In fact, he looked somewhat proud of himself as he said this, and looked at the two men sitting at the front player table. Representing the temple side was a promising newcomer, Roberto Vinkel. In contrast, the Sarandia Academy front player was Monica Norton, the sole girl in that group. Well, oh, well, what a poor girl. As a girl, she seems to be able to play a little bit, but against our ace, it must be a bit much for her. With that, Redding glanced at Boyd's stern face. With a grim face as if he were on the battlefield, Boyd responded with a low voice. Let me apologize in advance. Well, now. What are you apologizing for? Could it be that girl is too weak to be an opponent? I apologize for making Monica Norton the front player. Oh, I suppose Sarandia Academy went out of their way to choose female students to liven things up? Or perhaps that girl came from a family with a large donation? Well, I guess Sarandia Academy has a different school culture from the meritocratic temple. I'm sure that's the case, yes. Boyd didn't even look at Redding when he rambled on. He just kept his eyes straight on the students before opening his mouth. I've chosen Monica Norton as the front player because she was too inexperienced. Right, ladies rarely have the chance to play chess. So how long has she been playing chess? A year, maybe. Boyd showed him two of his thick fingers as Redding asked with a chuckle. Two weeks. While the teachers were having their conversation. A certain person had overheard them. He was a Minerva representative, Barney Jones. He raised his thin eyebrows and glared at Monica, who sat in the distance, with glinted eyes. Monica took a seat at the table provided, holding her aching stomach. The pain in her stomach was not due to the pressure of the game. It was caused by the nervousness of knowing that Barney might discover her true identity and the anxiety about whether Nero and Lynn would not cause a ruckus while watching over his highness. Although she wanted to believe that Nero and Lynn would be fine because she had repeatedly reminded them, she was still worried because they both seemed to have taken a liking to that outfit. As she let out a sigh, a male student from Temple sitting in front of her expressed his concern to Monica. Are you not feeling well? I am fine, really. The boy who introduced himself as Roberto Vinkel was apparently 16 years, a year younger than Monica, but his appearance seems to say otherwise. Not only was he tall, but his muscular figure looked more suited to swords and spears than chess. Along with his stiff black hair was cut short in his earnest look, he has represented the very typical figure of the student of Temple. For now. I need to focus on what's in front of me. It's time. Let's have a good match. L. Let's have a good match. She bit her tongue. Oh, this is so embarrassing. I hope there's a hole for me to hide, she thought in depression, but it only took a few seconds for her to regain her composure. When she looked up and faced the chessboard, the embarrassment and anxiety in Monica's mind disappeared and only the chessboard occupied her mind. Roberto was slightly surprised to see the apparent change in Monica's atmosphere. But not even his response can be perceived by Monica now. All she could see now were the pieces on the board. And so, Monica picked up the white knight and moved it with a curt motion. As the match began, Glenn Dudley, an always energetic 17-year-old guy, was sitting in the spectator section made an O-shape with his palm over his mouth, and tried to give a cheering. Noticing this, Neil, who was sitting next to him, covered his mouth. Don't shout during the game, Ugh. 
I just wanted to say, good luck. Monica no means no, as Lana's cheeks twitched at their exchange, Claudia smiled sinisterly. This was a smile that definitely didn't have anything good in mind. Kama so cheering loudly for Monica here while getting a mouth covered by Neil's hand, how vexing, I don't find any of this to be vexing about. Hey, more importantly, how's the match going? Who's winning now? Claudia looked at Lana's words with a look of utter dismay. Kama how can you expect to know the winner at this early stage? Lana, who didn't know much about chess, fell silent in embarrassment. Then Glenn, who had been released from Neil's hands, said in a slightly lower volume of voice than usual. Hey, don't you think the match in Monica's table progressing too quickly? It seems like the pieces are shifting twice as fast as the other tables, as Glenn had said. Only the front player's pieces live board which imitated their progress in chessboard were moving at an unusual speed. Students who were in charge of moving the pieces on the live board looked at the board and the chessboard alternately in a hurry. Lana asked Claudia, aware that question could lead her to be ridiculed. Hey, does chess follow a rule that the faster you play, the more advantage you get? Chess has a time limit, so there's nothing wrong with playing fast. But what happened at Monica's table was clearly too fast. Monica always took less than three seconds to make her next move right after Roberto made his move. From an outsider's point of view, she seemed to be moving her pieces without thinking. So Glenn clapped his hands. I get it. With the fast pacing method, you can put pressure on your opponent. At Glenn's words, Neil gave him a difficult look. Comma certainly. There are some people who take that approach, but, Neil trailed off and let out a small exclamation of admiration at the unfolding board. I doubt Miss Norton was thinking of putting pressure on her opponent or anything like that, Lana and Glenn, being amateurs, couldn't tell, but Neil and Claudia's expressions clearly changed when they saw Monica's match. Not just these two, but everyone who understood chess was watching the front player game with rapt attention. Comma on the chessboard, a terribly high-level match was being played at a frighteningly fast pace. When Roberto was on the offensive, Monica handled him with extreme precision. It was as if Monica had known the move was coming all along. The next move, and dozens of moves beyond that, progressing by reading each other's hands. The difference in the level of the front player match with the other player matches was obvious to everyone, except for about two people. Lana and Glenn. Sitting at the teacher's station, the temple teacher looked very pale and said, Two weeks? What? Two weeks, and Barney Jones, sitting at Minerva's section, casting his glaring dark eyes not at the board but at Monica. Checkmate, after Monica quietly declared, Roberto clenched his fists on his lap and hung his head. Comma I lost, the match, which was the most high-level game in the tournament was over in a surprisingly brief period of time, and with nearly an hour to spare, the Temple won the middle player and captain matches. The final outcome was two wins and one loss for the Temple side. But everyone in the room understood. Kama who's the strongest person in this place was. V7C11, based on chess as Earth GT silent which August 10th. 2021 six minutes I changed the name Roberto Vincere to Roberto Vinkel. After the first match, the student council hosted a simple buffet party that served as a social gathering exchange. Only representatives from each school, teachers, and student council members were allowed to participate. The students who had come to watch the game returned to their dormitories for lunch. So as not to draw attention to herself. Monica stood in a corner of the hall scanning her surroundings. She saw Barney chatting and eating with fellow Minerva students. Though he showed no signs of trying to approach Monica, she could not afford to let her guard down. It was better to keep as much distance as possible. While Monica had these thoughts in mind, Elliot and Benjamin approached her with plates of a light meal. I've seen your game record, Miss Norton. He sounded somewhat regretful. After all, Monica was the only one who won the match against the house, 
while Elliot and Benjamin lost. I hope I didn't make things uncomfortable because I was the only one who won, as Monica thought while freaked out. Elliot looked into Monica's face at extremely close range and pressed his index finger between her forehead. Oh, looks like you've been holding back pretty much in the practice match we've done before, and no, not at all, absolutely not, really, anyone who looked at this game record would think this match was like practicing a handicap game. What kind of match was that? Using new moves that defy traditional strategies, and in the last moment, you managed to achieve a complete reversal. I think this game has already gone into the history books of the chess world. I, I don't think that would be, as she desperately tried to find an excuse while having her forehead pressed down. Benjamin gently reminded Elliot, don't be too hard on your junior, then continued with, a concerto can only be created when both performers are on par with each other, and only then can a beautiful composition be created. In this match, her opponent was extremely strong. That's why Miss Norton was able to show off her abilities to the fullest. In other words, the fact that she hasn't been able to show off her true abilities until now is due to our inability. Don't be too hard on yourself. Oh, if it were possible, I would have liked to see the moment this beautiful music was born with my own eyes, not on the board. I wish I could have seen it. Oh, God. Why was I chosen as a representative? I wish I could have been a spectator, although Benjamin's words were an exaggeration, he was spot on. Her opponent, Roberto Winkle, was the strongest opponent Monica had ever faced, which allowed her to explore new moves. It was a fun match, Monica thought absent-mindedly when she saw someone approaching her. Despite being younger than her, he has a large, toned physique short black hair, and a sharp, fearless face, it was exactly the person they've been talked about, Monica's opponent, Roberto Winkle. Miss Monica Norton, when her name was called, Monica's shoulders jolted and she unconsciously hid behind Elliot and Benjamin. Monica was extremely shy, especially when it came to large men like Roberto. Her uncle, who had once beaten her, had been a huge man and the fear always haunted her. To tell the truth, Nero in his humanoid form was also quite a tall man, which Monica found difficult to deal with. Monica was getting jittery, and Roberto took a standing position like a soldier and opened his mouth. I was very impressed with the match earlier, thanks, therefore, Roberto opened his eyes with a snap and looked at Monica, who was trembling with fear. I want to make an engagement with you based on chess. A voice that resonated deeply from the bottom of his stomach, echoed throughout the hall. Cyril spurted out his drink, while Neil exclaimed, an engagement, and Bridget gave him a cold look as if he were a fool who couldn't read the atmosphere. Felix was still smiling with his usual calm smile, only, he was looking at Monica and the others with a certain amount of disquiet in his heart. Elliot who was closest to her, was speechless with his eyes and mouth open. Monica, like most people, was also flabbergasted. In the midst of this delicate atmosphere, the first to open his mouth was Benjamin. How deplorable, Benjamin shook out his flaxen hair and gazed up at the ceiling. Love is supposed to be a more passionate and emotionally stirring affair. There is no beauty in it. That proposal is not musically beautiful. Not even close to being a bad piece of music, Benjamin expressed his sorrow with his whole body and started to talk about his own theory of how love was supposed to be. The situation was about to get out of hand when Elliot, the group leader, got the role of mediator, took over. Oh, you know what? Music and all that aside, now, what kind of proposal was that? I'd let it aside if it was a normal engagement but an engagement based on chess, this is my first time hearing of it, I apologize for my lack of words. Let me explain my thoughts now, and I hope that Miss Norton could give it positive consideration, Roberto continued to speak in an upright position and in a ridiculously serious manner. I was struck by Miss Norton's chess. She is the first person of her age who has been able to overwhelm me. 
If I could, I would love to play more chess with her, but we are from different schools and have nothing in common. However, being engaged would give us a reason to meet on weekends and during long vacations. We can play chess there to the fullest. Therefore, I would like to ask you to propose you to become my fiancé, Miss Norton. Indeed, the meant of an engagement based on chess were true to its words, and the explanation was foolishly honest. Wow, he's so selfish, it's almost refreshing, it's not so musical, not even beautiful. Even though Elliot and Benjamin's faces were scrunched up, Roberto continued to speak with no concern for them. I am the fifth son of a baron in the Randall Kingdom. Perhaps, I won't be able to inherit the title, but I plan to join the Randall Knights eventually. Those who excel in chess can become candidates for the Commander of the Knight Order. I pride myself on the fact that my future is quite secure. And my family, the Baronial family, is free of debts. Both of my parents are upstanding. I'm on good terms with my brothers. I also have three dogs. Please feel free to consider marrying into our family at ease. The situation has gone too far. Eh, anyway, I have to decline. In the first place, Monica Norton was her temporary identity. Her true identity was that of one of the seven sages who was infiltrating school as the second prince's bodyguard. The engagement was not possible. I am sorry. I. I I can't. Why? Do you already have a fiancé? I I don't. But, what a stupidly honest answer, Elliot thought as he looked at Monica in amazement. However, Monica was not skilled enough to tell an appropriate lie in such a situation. When Monica fidgeted around, Roberta urged her further. If you are worried about marrying into another country, please rest assured. I will do my best to support you in every aspect of your life, lifestyle, language, and social circles. I want you to feel comfortable in your own life and let you focus on chess. No, I mean, I'm. I'm sorry I I I I I I I I I I Unable to stand it any longer, Monica flew out from behind Elliot's back and ran towards the hallway. Despite her shabby and pathetic running style, it was Monica's way of running as fast as she could. Miss Norton. I haven't done talking. When Roberto tried to follow Monica, a pair of hands suddenly pressed on both of his shoulders. Felix had his hand on his right shoulder, and Cyril had his hand on his left. It looked like a slight tap on the shoulder to the casual observer, but if one looked closely, the pressure was strong enough to cause wrinkles on the clothes. Excuse me. She's a member of our student council. Why don't you talk to me about it first? You're behaving inappropriately in an exchange gathering. As a student council member, I can't overlook this. Felix was smiling, but his eyes weren't. On the other hand, Cyril has a cold, indifferent expression on his face, spreading cold air. And Elliot, his face tightened at the sight of impending chaos. V7C12 my friend Azareth GT silent which August 12, 2021 11 minutes after running out of the banquet venue, Monica stopped in her tracks when she reached down the end of the stairs that connected the second floor to the first floor. Due to her lack of exercise, she was out of breath after only a short run. Leaning her back against the wall, Monica tried to regulate her ragged breathing. That was scared me. Needless to say, that was the first time someone has proposed an engagement to her. Roberto was neither attracted to Monica's looks nor her personality. He was just attracted to Monica's chess skills and proposed to her to be his fiancé so that they could have more opportunities to play chess. If it was someone else who had been there, most people would have raised an eyebrow and said, that's ridiculous however, Monica found it reasonable and even impressive. Whatever people say about falling in love or loving someone, the idea of love simply didn't make sense to Monica who had never been in love. Rather than being told that he was in love with her looks which were less than average, has no social skills, and can't say anything clever, it would be easier to understand if he just honestly told her that he proposed engagement because he wanted to play chess. 
but that did not change the fact she couldn't accept the engagement itself. This is going to be troublesome. Returning to the venue now would obviously be a bad idea. Perhaps I should hide somewhere until the upcoming match against Minerva begins. As she was considering this, she saw something flickering up ahead. Kamae, five flaming arrows were floating in front of Monica. The moment Monica uttered a sound, those flaming arrows flew straight towards her. It was an attack that a normal person would be unable to avoid. But Monica instantly formed a barrier with no chanting, preventing the flaming arrow from reaching her. I knew it, you're that Monica. A voice came from the upper stairs sent a chill down Monica's spine. She looked up slowly and saw Barney standing on a stair landing. His face was shaded in contrast to the light coming through the glass window, displaying the cruel smile which clearly visible on his face. He then descended the stairs slowly and stood in front of Monica, who remained cowering, unable to move an inch, and scoffed at her. Why are the seven sages pretending to be students in this school? Was the rumor that you were hauled up in a mountain cabin a total fabrication? No. I, Monica desperately tried to speak. But as she was unable to get the words out, her vision went dizzy. Could it be that you're hiding your true identity to start your school life all over again? Pretending to be a student at Sarandia Academy, the most prestigious school in this kingdom. How extravagant your playing could be. On top of that, you've got several guys in your romantic life. Haha, ha. you seem to have a fulfilling life. Monica was dumbfounded at the mention of having a man in her romantic life. Perhaps, or even without considering, he was referring to that incident. He's talking about Nero and Lynn. Apparently, Barney had taken her familiar and that spirit's all out prank to heart. But she can't honestly tell him all the details, since the mission to escort the second prince was top secret. While Monica was hanging over her head pondering, Barney reached over and touched the ribbon tied in Monica's hair. You've changed your look quite a bit, haven't you? It never crossed my mind that it might be you until I heard your name. You seem to have changed a lot even when you can't even talk to people properly. Are you trying to be stylish? I, good for you, isn't it? A man from a neighboring country even proposed to you. The more Barney's words cut into Monica's heart, the more hurt she appeared to be, and the deeper his smile grew. Oh, I get it. You pretended to be a helpless student to get close to the second prince, didn't you? It sounds like something you do, pretend to be helpless and then get on someone's good side, so you can take advantage of their kindness, right? Like a parasite, Monica was stunned by the severe insults thrown at her. Is that what Barney thought of me? If only they could talk again like they used to, but that sliver of hope was trampled on by Barney with a muck. Monica Everett was hated by Barney. She was ostracized. She was despised, that was the reality. The corners of Monica's eyelids were slowly growing hot. I can't cry here. Clenching her teeth. Monica struggled to hold back a sob. But the back of her nose was still tingling. The hopelessness made her want to collapse at her feet and cry out loudly. A devious person like you is bound to be disregarded by everyone in no time, I know. I know that nobody will ever want me for anything. Nevertheless, in her childhood, Monica was happy that Barney stretching out his helping hand. That was why she just wanted to be proud of becoming his friend, nothing more. I guess I was too selfish in wanting you to accept me as your friend. Stop right there, a valiant girl's voice echoed in the hallway. As Monica lifted her head, she saw a girl running toward her with the hem of her skirt fluttering wide. It was Lana Colette. She stepped in between Monica and Barney and glared at Barney with glaring, sharp eyes. I might not have heard a conversation, but what the hell is going on here? You're from Minerva, right? Oh, pardon me. Are you a student of this school? I asked you what kind of situation is this? Why don't you answer me? Or is it common practice in Minerva to corner a girl in the hallway and make her cry? When Lana lifted her thin chin and glared at Barney, 
He plastered a thin smile on his face and shrugged his shoulders. I apologize for not introducing myself. My name is Barney Jones and I'm a representative of Minerva. Monica and I are old acquaintances. We were chatting about the old days, and she got emotional and started crying because of nostalgia. In response to Barney's smooth speech, Lana glared at him suspiciously. So, you're the person, that Monica didn't want to meet, Lana muttered to herself and looked at Monica who was on the verge of crying. Let's go to the makeup room, I'll fix your makeup there, oh okay, after saw Monica nodded, Lana gave Barney a gracious lady's smile. I apologize, Lord Jones. I have to fix my friend's makeup, so if you'll excuse me, friend, at Lana's words. Barney's thin eyebrows raised and a smirk crept into his mouth. I think you should stop befriending that person. I am sure you would end up feeling unpleasant later. She is trying to take advantage of others by pretending she can't do anything herself. After all, hearing Barney's words, Monica's body trembled as if she had been lashed with a whip. H-A-A-A-A-H, Lana's ladylike smile twitched, and a blue streak popped up on her forehead. Monica is not the kind of person who would do such a thing, she's pretending to be helpless, feigning can't do anything, but mocking others behind their back, Lana's eyes coldly looked at Bernie. You really don't know much about people, do you? Why don't you get yourself a new pair of glasses instead of those ugly ones with no sense of style? This time, the smiling Barney's face twitched. Lana and Barney both wore their most formal smiles. But their eyes weren't, and their eyebrows were twitching. And the first person to break the tense atmosphere was Barney. You'll regret it, I'm certain. Didn't you see the chess match earlier? She's really smarter and more talented than anyone else. And yet, she's latching on to others' kindness, hiding her true identity, putting on a face that says she's powerless and can't do anything, hiding her true identity. Those words made Monica gulp her saliva. It was as Barney said. Monica has been hiding her identity as the Seven Sages. She's been lying to Lana. Monica cowered back, but Lana reached out and squeezed Monica's hand. Then instead of Monica, she turned her harsh eyes on Barney. Hey, why don't you be honest with me? You're jealous of Monica, aren't you? At Lana's remark. Barney's figure frozen for a moment. Barney's smile began to fade. And underneath the mask of the smile that had fallen off, what was revealed was, anger and hatred. I'm sure you'll learn it one day. How much of a difference between you and her, whether you like it or not, if my friend was outstanding, I would brag her to my father. I'd tell him how great my friend was, how proud I was of her. And yet, how can you be so narrow-minded? Ah, I guess ordinary people with no academic ability can't even feel a sense of frustration when the gap between them and geniuses is too wide. The moment Barney finished his mocked words toward Lana, Monica had opened her mouth before she even thought about it. Barney. Lana and Bernie looked at Monica in surprise at her unusual loud voice. Still unable to think clearly. Monica continued to squeeze out her voice. Don't you dare say anything bad about my friend, or I won't be able to forgive you, Barney scoffed dauntingly at Monica's words. And what does it matter if you don't forgive me? Do you think your words are going to hurt me now? The words he delivered were full of venom, but not with the same vigor as before. He was probably surprised at Monica who had never once talked back against him. After taking a long breath, Monica said the words she had been unable to say for a long time. Comma Barney, I know I've always relied on you, but abuse of it, I also wanted to be a great person that you could rely on. Monica had always asked Barney for his help. She hoped to become the kind of friend who could laugh at each other on equal terms someday. Comma I just wished you to acknowledge me as your friend, nothing more. And when I did great or worked hard, I didn't hope to be acknowledged by someone else, but you, Barney, but it was an impossible dream. Maybe hoping for such a thing was already wrong from the beginning. But now, I'm giving up trying to get you to acknowledge me. 
I won't ask for anything from you again. Monica closed her eyes lids as if to cut off everything. And when she opened her eyelids again, the boy she once believed to be her best friend no longer reflected in her eyes again. Once Monica turned her back on Barney, he reached out to her as if he wanted to say something to her. But Lana slapped his hand away mercilessly. A man who keeps attached after that is lame, you know that, Lana dismissively said, intertwining her own arm with Monica's. While Barney simply stood there, without uttering a word. After a short walk side by side, Lana let out a satisfied snort. You did a good job of speaking your mind, Lana grinned, and Monica gave a small nod with a blush. Today I feel, a little stronger, Monica looked at her uniform and smiled, the corners of her lips curling up into a smile. Thanks to the corset, I feel my back more straight, and because of my makeup, when I felt like crying, I was able to hold back my tears because I knew if I cried, my makeup would fall off. It was all thanks to you, Lana, I promised to make you look more pretty than this. When Monica nodded her head, Lana smiled cheerfully and hugged Monica's arm tightly. The moment he heard Monica's statement, a crack appeared in Barney Jones' train of thought. Two years ago, Barney thought he had achieved a sense of relief when he had cut off his friendship with Monica. Every time someone praised the silent witch of the seven sages, Somewhere in the back of Barney's mind would have thought about these, I was the one who had taken care of that girl. Comma I was the one who hurt her and trampled on that girl. The sight of the genius girl, who had even been chosen as one of the seven sages, sobbing and begging for forgiveness from him brought him a certain wicked pleasure. But Monica no longer wanted anything from Barney. Not even expecting it. Monica had decided so and turned her back on Barney. The way her back was leaving away was the opposite of what it had been two years ago. At that time, it was Barney who left Monica behind. Now Barney was left behind. Wrong, wrong, wrong. Monica needed to be more conscious of Barney. She should be more and more conscious and terrified of Barney. Comma this is not acceptable. Barney strode quickly down the hallway looking for Pittman, the teacher in charge of Minerva. Since Pittman had said, I am not used at festive places, he did not show up at the banquet venue. So when Barney went to the waiting room, as expected, he found him there reading a book by himself. Mr. Pittman. Pittman turned from his book and rounded his eyes at Barney, who stormed in as soon as he entered the waiting room. Oh, what's happened to you? You have such a scary look on your face, please make me the front player for the next match. What? Wait, you can't just change it at the last minute. I'll get scolded if I do that, it should be possible with the signatures of the advisor and the teacher of the host school. With that, Barney dragged a flustered Pittman to the staff room. Normally, it would be logical to ask Professor Boyd of Serendia Academy for his signature but that would mean returning to the banquet venue where other Minerva students would be there. And he didn't have time to persuade them one by one. Any teacher's signature of Serendia Academy should do good enough. As he opened the door to the staff room, he saw an old professor sitting there. He recognized that face. It was Professor McGregan, who used to be a practical teacher at Minerva until a few years ago. Great. Barney thought as he lifted the corner of his lips into a smile after considering how bad the sight of Professor McRigan has. Professor. McRigan, could you please sign this document, him? Who are you? I'm a participant in a chess tournament. I urgently need a teacher's signature concerning the event venue. Barney arranged the appropriate lies and presented the documents to Professor McRigan. Pittman, who had been dragged in halfway asked, do you know this old man, but Barney ignored him. A signature. Sure, sure. Is this okay? Is not sticking out of the box, is it? Yes, it's perfect. All right, let me submit this document to Mr. Boyd for you, Professor McGregan. Okay, oh, say hi to Mr. Boyd for me, having successfully obtained McGregan's signature, Barney smirked. 
Now he can be the front player in the next match. He can have a match against Monica. I won't allow you to ignore me. Whatever the past or future, Monica Everett must be frightened and shriveled up by Barney Jones, ever. V7C13, ruthlessly. As Earth GT silent which August 15, 2021 7 minutes after Lana had fixed her makeup, Monica returned to the match when she found a strange scene unfolding in the audience. All the spectators sat on chairs prepared by the Academy to watch the match, but with an exception of one person sitting on the floor. It was Roberto Vinkel, the man who proposed engagement to Monica based on the chess premise and was promptly rejected. On his back was a piece of paper that said, I am reflecting, sandwiching Roberto's left and right sides were Felix with his smiling face and Cyril with his frowning face. In addition, Sitting behind him, Redding, Temple S advisor, folded his arms while glaring at Roberto. As Monica was taken aback by the unapproachable atmosphere, Roberto noticed her and raised his voice as he sat upright. Miss Monica, once this tournament is over, I'd like to continue discussing the previous matter. Professor Redding dropped a fist into his head at Roberto's stubborn attempt. Then Felix and Cyril on either side added a cold remark to Roberto who was rubbing his beaten head. Vinkel, I believe I have not yet given you permission to speak. Any action that disturbs the participants before the match is strictly prohibited. The atmosphere in Roberto's area was unusually chilly. Scary. Looking at the flustered Monica, Elliot and Benjamin beckoned her over. So she took advantage of this and quickly ran over to them. W what happened to seat over there, just pretend you don't see anything. And don't ask me what happened during your absence. Cause I didn't see anything. Okay, I will say it again. I didn't see anything, I had no idea the student council president who is famous for his gentle demeanor could be so ruthless. I certainly heard George Altmyer's requiem, God's wrath shall pour down here played in my mind that time. Monica didn't know what was going on, but what she did know for sure was something terrifying had happened. Deciding that it would be better for her not to know, Monica nodded her head in agreement with Elliot's advice. None of the players from Minerva's side seemed to have arrived yet. Since neither the players nor their advisor teachers were in sight. But when the three people from the Serendia Academy side took their seats, the three people from the Minerva side showed up just in time. Leading the group was Barney Jones. She thought he would take the captain's seat, but contrary to her expectation, he walked right past Elliot and took the seat across from Monica. That action caused Elliot to raise one eyebrow and turned at Barney. Hey, aren't you sitting in the wrong seat? You're the captain, aren't you? We have just submitted a notice to change our role. So I'm pretty sure this should be my seat. Actually, Barney had been the captain of the team but changed his role to be the front player because he considered Monica to be a formidable opponent, which was considered as an insult to Elliot. Elliot retracted his usual frivolous smile and directed his cold eyes at Barney. I think that was not a very smart move, I know it's disrespectful. However, there are some circumstances that I just can't give up. Other than Barney, the two people from Minerva's side looked somewhat confused as well. Perhaps the change of role was Barney's own decision. Monica was surprised, but not perturbed. Strangely, her mind was calm. Barney, who had been so scary to face, was now not scary at all. Barney took his gaze off Elliot and turned to look at Monica. His eyes were telling him this. Come a look at me. Be more conscious of me, however, Barney's obsession no longer reached Monica's heart. Once Monica cast her eyes down to the board, nothing else occupied her mind anymore but chess. There's no room for Barney to get in. Let's have a good game, let's have a good game, the first move was made by Barney. Soon after, Monica made the next move. Barney played chess in a very aggressive manner. His style was filled with a strong will to win, regardless of how many pieces he had to sacrifice. Unfortunately, it was shattered head-on by Monica. 
Barney was supposed to be the captain so he would prove to be very strong. But, his playstyle was vulnerable. He will use anything to win, no matter how many sacrifices he had to. As if all those sacrifices, moves, and strategies were in vain, Monica crushed Barney's moves one by one with precision. With the same ruthlessness with which she had once shot a wyvern between the eyes. Meanwhile, Claudia, in the spectator's seat, looked at the developments on the board and blurted out. She sure pretty ruthless, how many people can make Claudia, who has a reputation for her ruthless with her words, say that person was ruthless? Glenn, who was not familiar with chess, asked Neil while looking at the live board. Uh, will Monica be able to win? It's not she won't able, Neil shook his head with a stern face. She's already won, eh? Glenn widened his eyes and let out a silly voice. It was understandable that he was surprised. It had only been 20 minutes or so since the match had started. If Monica's already won, why is the match still going on? At this point, Miss Norton's victory is almost certain. However, her opponent is not willing to admit his defeat and keeps struggling. He's desperate to bring the match to a stalemate. Since he would lose all his face if he lost in 20 minutes after had gone out of his way to lower himself to be the front player from the captain, so he's trying his best to buy time. Poor him, Glenn cast a pitying look at Barney. Next to him, Lana, who had been silent until now, folded her arms and snorted with pride. Yep, Monica's different today, then how come you're the one who's so excited about it? Of course I will be excited since my friend was the one who wins the match. If it was me, I would be happy and proud if someone complimented me on something I like. Lana lifted her slender chin as she said so, followed by a quiet declare of checkmate made by Monica. Checkmate, so Monica declared, and at the same time, Barney was shaking violently and ruffling his bangs. Monica was looking at the board blankly. All she saw were the black and white pieces, completely oblivious to Barney. She had always been like that. Always engrossed with magic, never paid any attention to Barney. Actually, he had realized it. Monica was a real genius, and he was just an ordinary guy who was a little bit better than everybody else. And he knew that there was a solid wall he would never be able to overcome. Shit. When Barney stood up yanking on his chair and ran out of the venue, Monica did not chase him, nor did she call out to him. Even up until the last moment when Barney off out of the venue, her eyes were still fixed on the pieces on the board. That's what reality was. Shit, shit, shit. Back in the waiting room, Barney slammed his fist against the wall. He knew what he did was not clever at all. Even so. He couldn't help looking for something to blame. Come um, Jones, knocking discreetly on the door, Pittman approached Barney. Apparently, he had followed him all the way from the venue. Look, I know it's frustrating to lose, but you can't keep staying here, you know. I mean, you need to greet other participants at the end of the match, I'm sorry. I'll be back in a little while, alright. But don't be too late. Or that scary looking teacher will stare at you. He was probably referring to Boyd, the chess teacher at Sarandia Academy, who had a scary face. Indeed, he had a feeling that that terrifying mercenary gaze would make him begging for life when it cast at him. Wait. Barney suddenly felt an odd discomfort. No, he had been feeling it before, and it was not the first time. He hadn't noticed it because he was too busy worrying about his match, but this had happened before when he was in the staff room. Once Barney suppressed his anger toward Monica, he turned to face Pittman. Dot. Professor Pittman, may I ask you to teach me chess again when we return to Minerva? Well, sure, if it's okay with you. At those words, Barney was convinced. Kama who are you? Pittman rounded his eyes in disbelief at Barney's question. A. What do you mean by who? I am Eugene Pittman. The teacher of Minerva, Professor Pittman I know is an advisor for the chess club who's terrible at chess. 
He himself always said that there was nothing he could teach us because of how terrible he is. Well, there are times when I'd like to show off my skills in front of my students. You see, then can you tell me what subjects do you teach? What is your specialty in magic? Pittman fell silent as the questions came at him in a barrage. Now he was thinking about this, it felt strange. As a former student of Minerva, there was no way Pittman didn't know McGregan, who had been teaching practical spells at Minerva for years when they arrived at the staff room. And yet, that time he said this. Comma do you know this old man, the same was true regarding Professor Boyd. It was odd that Pittman, who has participated in the chess tournament as an advisor, forgot about his name. Comma I will ask you again, who are you? When Barney asked in a critical tone, Pittman's unreliable smile peeled away and his lips lifted in an arc. V7C14, Barney's lie as Earth GT silent which August 17, 2021 8 minutes Eugene Pittman was a professor who taught range magic in Minerva and was also the advisor to the chess club. With his mild personality, he was somewhat indecisive. The typical unreliable gentleman. But that Pittman, or rather, the person who had been impersonating Pittman, was grinning, with his mouth curved up like a crescent moon. Wow, I guess Minerva's kids are really smart. Tip. His voice was distinctly different from that of Pittman. It was too low for a woman and too high-pitched for a man, almost sweet and sticky, like burnt honey simmered in a pot. The person who took the appearance of Pittman grinned with a mouth like a crescent moon and lifted one hand to chant quickly. He's a magician. When it comes to the magic battle, Barney, who can use shortened chanting, has the overwhelming advantage. But just as Barney began to chant a shortened spell, the fake Pittman was chanting as well as he lunged at Barney. His hand moved like holding a whip and struck Barney in the stomach. Gah. The fake Pittman then pointed the tip of his finger at Barney, who winced as he held his stomach. Be bound, lightning chain. Upon completing the last verse of his chant, an electric shock shot out from the fake Pittman's fingertips. It bound Barney's entire body like a chain, causing him a sharp pain all over his body. Guhaira, unable to bear the intense pain, Barney convulsed on the floor, wincing. The fake Pittman put his hand over his mouth and chuckled. Oh dear, an assassin doesn't necessarily use magic as his only weapon, you know? Magic sure is useful, but not very efficient, assassin. That one word was enough for Barney to understand the purpose of this man. Perhaps this man has switched places with Minerva's teacher and infiltrated Serendia Academy to assassinate an important person. And of all the important people, only one person who will always show up at this chess tournament came to mind. His goal is to assassinate the second prince, Felix Arcridil. Should the second prince be assassinated, it would definitely destroy the political balance in the country. That alone must be prevented. More importantly, his pride would not allow this guy who talked like a fool to continue to beat him up. Barney silenced his voice and tried to do a shortened chant. However, the fake Pittman caught on immediately and stomped over his head. Which stopped Barney from chanting as his face slammed into the floor, and his glasses cracked and tumbled across the floor. His nose and mouth are in pain, with some blood coming out of them. Don't you think magic is inconvenient? They are quite powerful when activated but the need of using chants each time used makes them inferior to simple violence like this. I do like guns but they make a lot of noise, so they aren't really suitable for assassination, following by twirling his fingertips, the fake Pittman chanted some line. It was a water spell. Death by drowning is awful, you know? The corpse is going to be soggy, just like this face I borrowed, Barney turned pale as he realized what he meant by those words. The real Eugene Pittman had been drowned in this same water ball, unable to escape. You can't chant in the water, what better way to kill a sorcerer? Now, go die in a water cage, helpless and struggling, just as the fake Pittman was about to swing his finger down, the door to the waiting room opened. 
A small figure could be seen behind the door. It was a frightened looking Monica. Comma Barney. Monica screamed at the sight of Barney lying on the floor covered in bruises. The fake pitman clicked his tongue and directed his fingertip where the water ball had been floating from Barney to Monica. It was impossible for the dull Monica to avoid it, which naturally, lead her to be trapped in the water ball helplessly. Comma it would be a problem if you start screaming. Unfortunately, you're going to die right there, little girl, inside the water ball. Monica was struggling, breathing air bubbles out of her mouth. This water ball has a strong inward barrier which made it easy to enter but hard to escape. Once a person was trapped inside, it would be difficult for that person to escape. No matter how skilled the magician was, without the ability to chant, there was nothing she could do but wait for death. Comma right, if she was a magician who needed to chant. There was a cracking sound like glass breaking. When the fake pitman turned around, he was startled looking at the water ball barrier that trapped Monica had a crack, and now it was leaking out water. How did you? As soon as the fake pitman shouted, the barrier shattered completely, leaving Monica to fell on the floor, with water spraying all over her. After coughing heavily, she then cast a spell without chanting. She created an invisible mass of wind, then swung it down over his head, slamming the fake pitman's body down on the floor relentlessly. Guha, wa, how, who did? In the state where his body was pressed down onto the floor, the fake pitman was scanning his surroundings with bloodshot eyes. I see. Looking at the fake pitman's behavior, Barney was secretly convinced. The fake pitman hasn't realized that the wielder of this wind magic was Monica. After all, people believe that one cannot use magic without chanting, that much was common sense. And yet, the sole abnormal magician in the world who had ignored that common sense, and that abnormal, silent witch, was such a tiny girl, who could imagine that? When the thought of Monica was the user of the no chance spell slipped off from his mind, what left for the fake pitman was perhaps wary of the magicians lurking in his surrounding. Monica slightly raised her head to look at the fake pitman. With just that gesture, she cast her next spell. It was an elementary electric shock spell. The power was not very high, but it was enough to render one person unconscious. The fake pitman jolted convulsively and stopped moving as his eyes went white. Monica let out a sigh of relief and slowly stood up to look at Barney. Come on, um, are you okay? It's nothing serious, actually, it hurt a little to the point of bringing tears to his eyes, but Barney held back his tears and rubbed the blood from his nose with his hand. While doing so, he picked up his glasses that had fallen to the floor. The lenses were cracked, but it was better than nothing. After putting them on his nose, he could see Monica's face looking at him worriedly. He never thought that the day would come when he would be helped by Monica like this. As he bit down on his bitterness, he heard a knocking sound coming from the window. A small yellow bird was perched on the window frame. When Monica opened the window, the little bird flew into the room, and the next moment, it transformed into a human form. That figure looked familiar to him. He was a handsome man with golden hair and an out-of-place flamboyant formal dress. He was clearly not a human, but a higher-ranking spirit. You've handled the assassin brilliantly, Miss, Silent Witch. Lynn, this man may possibly be a diversion, so please keep an eye out for suspicious conversations elsewhere. Also, I want you to tell Nero to look out for any magical reactions in the surroundings for a while, yes. Mom, after listening to the exchange between the spirit and Monica, Barney finally understood why Monica was enrolling in this school. In the first place, with how shy Monica was, there was no way she would voluntarily enroll herself into Serendia Academy. She was probably on an escort mission for the second prince, a top secret one at that. And that must be the reason why Monica was here, at this school. After transformed into a beautiful blonde man, the spirit took a rope out of nowhere and tied up the fake pitman. As she watched, Monica glanced at Barney and opened her mouth. Barney, what is it? 
Monica smiled somewhat sadly when she heard Barney's blunt reply. Comma I think my fake school life will be over now. The assassination attempt would surely be treated as a major incident. Since there have already been casualties of Minerva's people, they would not be able to cover up this incident. Considering Monica had captured the assassin, her true identity would soon be known. Then, she would no longer be able to stay at Serendia Academy. After taking all of that situation into an account, she heard footsteps from a distance. Perhaps someone had come to investigate the situation here. Barney who heard it, quickly spoke up. Make that spirit back into a bird. Hurry, up, A. Eh? Monica was confused by his instructions, but the humanoid spirit beside her quickly reverted to its bird form. Barney had the spirit which had turned into a bird. Almost at the same time, two people came into the waiting room. They were Sarah Lashley and Neil Clay Maywood, the student council members of Serendia Academy. What the hell is going on? A. Are you okay, Miss Norton? Your whole body is completely soaked. The room was in such a chaotic situation. Pittman sprawled out with the whites of his eyes, Barney with an injured face, Monica completely soaked. No matter how one looked at it, it was totally not a normal situation. Cyril removed his coat and put it over Monica, then asked Barney. Minerva's Captain Barney Jones. Explain the cause of that injuries. Cyril looked at Barney with suspicion. Under these circumstances, he would suspect Barney had done harm to Pittman and Monica, which was not unreasonable. But Barney answered calmly. I had suspected Eugene Pittman had been replaced by an assassin. When I discovered his true identity, he attempted to attack me but I was able to turn the tables on him. Miss Monica Norton was a victim who happened to be in the waiting room at that time. Cyril and Neil's eyes widened in disbelief at Barney's confession. Barney looked down at the fake Pittman, adjusting his tilted glasses. This imposter may not be disguising but using whatever spells to change the body directly. He also said something that implied he had murdered the real Eugene Pittman. We need to contact Minerva as soon as possible, since the Riddle Kingdom forbade the use of spells that could change the body directly. The places where this assassin had obtained that technique to change his body could only be a few. And the first one that came to mind was, the Eastern Empire, the only country that had lifted the ban on the use of medical spells applied to the body directly. Now the Empire had been involved, this matter has become a major incident. Perhaps sensing this, Cyril gave Neil instructions with a grim face. I'll keep the scene under control and have Barney Jones fill me up for further details. General Affairs Manager Maywood, please report about this incident to His Highness. Yes, sir. Also, take Treasurer Norton to the infirmary. I'm sure some of her friends were among the spectators. Bring them with her, Neil nodded briskly and asked Monica, Can you stand up? Monica glanced at Barney, still covered with Cyril's coat. Barney. Um. Er, why did he keep quiet about the fact that she had defeated an assassin and was the silent witch? That's what Monica's eyes expressed. Barney smiled his usual fearless smile and muttered as he adjusted his tilted glasses with his fingertips. You better be grateful to me for the rest of your life. Cyril and Neil looked dubious, unsure of the true meaning of these words in which Monica responded by bowing deeply to Barney before left the waiting room, accompanied by Neil. V7C15, meanwhile in another place, Cyril Ashley was sneezing as a Earth GT silent which August 19, 2021 8 minutes the match between Serendia Academy and Minerva in the chess tournament resulted in a winner for Monica between the front players and a winner for Minerva between the middle players. With one win and one loss, the match between the two captains will settle the final winner. Although the match between captains was about to end, Lana was more concerned about Monica than the chess match. Not long after Barney Jones was defeated and ran out of the venue, Monica also left the venue. Probably chasing after him. Lana was worried that Barney would lash out at Monica and say something awful to her again. 
but since Cyril and Neil seemed to have gone to the waiting room to check on her, she thought it was unlikely, but some uneasiness still lingering in her mind. After a while, Neil returned with a hurried pace. He didn't walk back to his seat but went over to Felix to inform him about something. He is not with Vice President Ashley? The absence of Cyril and the sight of Neil's grim face made Lana even more anxious. At that moment, the captain's match had come to an end. The winner was Elliot Howard. With two wins and one loss, the Sarandia Academy side emerged as the winner. There would be a short break after this, and then the matches between Temple and Minerva would take place, but... Felix stood up and said, I'm terribly sorry to interrupt when the match has just ended. Everyone, I have some information to announce in a loud volume, where the usually gentle and kind smile was missing from his face. I've just received a report that an intruder had infiltrated into this school. Lana was taken aback by the unexpected announcement. The surprise was shared by everyone in the venue. Followed by the anxious feeling crept up in their mind. As if to calm the apprehension, Felix softened the tone of his voice slightly. Please rest assured. We've already detained the intruder and have the guards standing by outside this venue. However, just to be safe, I'd ordered the guards to make a sweep of the school, so I hope everyone could stay here for a while. When Felix finished with his words, everyone was abuzz. Still, no one panicked, probably because they had been told that guards were standing outside. Wait a minute. What about Monica? She's not in the venue right now. Just as Lana was about to speak up, a figure quietly approached their seats. It was Neil. May I have a moment? He beckoned to Lana, Claudia, and Glenn and whispered, I've been told Miss Norton was at the scene when the intruder was subdued. Wah! Neil quickly covered Glenn's mouth when he was about to scream. These days, Neil seemed to be getting better and better at covering Glenn's mouth. He then added, S-H-H-H-H, reminding him before continuing with his words. Fortunately, Miss Norton wasn't injured but I imagine she's in shock, so, can you guys please stay by her side, where's Monica right now, Lana quickly inquired, and Neil replied in a whisper so that the others could not hear, she's in the infirmary, thus, at Neil's request, Lana, Claudia, and Glenn sneaked out of the venue and headed for the infirmary, escorted by guards, Monica, are you there, after knocking on the infirmary door, she peeked inside. Instead of the school nurse, she was confronted by the sight of Monica sat on a chair. Comma in her underwear, where she was wearing nothing but a male coat. Lana quickly elbowed Glenn, pushing him out of the infirmary, and slammed the door shut, leaving Claudia and herself alone inside. She could hear Glenn scream, that's mean, from the hallway, but that was not important right now. Monica didn't seem to feel anything in particular about being seen in her underwear by Glenn, as she only glanced up at Lana saying, Ah, Lana still sitting nonchalantly. Lana approached Monica with large strides and asked in a quivering voice, Come Monica, whose code is that? Oh, this? Lord Cyril lent it to me. Lana face palmed with both hands and looked up at the ceiling. Vice President Ashley. I totally misjudged you. A. L. Lana, what's more, how could he leave a girl dressed like this and go off somewhere? He's just horrible. Looking at how upset Lana was, Monica became flustered. While the calm Claudia, alone, looked at the wet uniform hanging in the corner of the room and seemingly had a general idea of what was happening. Comma I don't think that block-headed man has the guts to leave a girl alone in this state. I mean that's the only thing I can think of after looking at her appearances, as Lana yelled in bloodshot eyes, Claudia pointed to a uniform hanging in the corner of the room. She was surprised when saw it when Monica spoke in a whisper. Well, um. I got my uniform soaked and it was cold, so I took it off to dry it off. But I didn't know how to take off the corset by myself, so I was glad when I saw you coming here. Lana was silent for a while, 
But then she turned her head and looked at Monica with serious eyes. Kama you're not injured, are you? No, does anything hurt? Uh -huh. After Monica gave several curt nods, Lana crouched down and let out a heavy sigh of relief. After Lana removed her corset, Monica took off her soaking wet underwear and changed into simple sleepwear in the infirmary. In fact, she has been trembling in cold to have borrowed one of the thin blankets from the bed and wrap it over. Meanwhile, Claudia wordlessly offered her a tin mug which she had prepared to warm her body. Monica gratefully accepted and sipped the contents of the cup, then stiffened, stuck her tongue out. Tea this is so spicy, I mixed ginger, chili pepper, and citrus peel in it. It'll warm you up. It was the kind mixture only focusing on how effective in warming the body while disregarding the taste itself, but as she sipped on it, her body began to warm up from the inside out. Monica heaved out her breath, and Glenn, who had finally been allowed to enter the room, asked. So, what exactly happened? I heard from the student council president that there's an intruder. Monica pondered over how much she should elaborate. Apparently. Word of the intruder had gotten out to the people in the venue. Even so, the extent of the information that Monica knew would sooner or later spread. I think I should keep the matter of the assassin being disguised as my nervous teacher to myself. Thanks to Barney's quick thinking, Monica's status in that situation was that of a passing victim. The assassin probably has no idea he was attacked by Monica's no chance spell, so if Barney can get the word across, Monica can still continue to live in this school. But, there was only one thing Monica didn't understand. Why did Barney cover up for me? Looking at how much he had hated Monica. How he had ridiculed her for pretending to be a student, saying that was suited her very well. But in the end, he had made up a lie so as not to reveal Monica's true identity. Kama you better be grateful to me for the rest of your life. Ever since I met you. I've been so grateful to you, Barney. I guess I can't really understand him, Monica thought with a sigh as she explained the situation. Comma well, after I chased after Barney. I mean, Minerva's captain, to the waiting room, I found him in combat with the assassin, I see. So you got caught up in that battle, huh? Did your clothes get soaked because of water spells or something, yes. Yeah. It was some kind of spell to confine the enemy with water ball, as Monica explained how her uniform got soaked, Claudia stared at her with unreadable expressions. Dot. Gotten involved in poison attempt at a tea party, caught up in the collapse of a piece of wood, and now encountering an assassin, what a fulfilling school life you have there. I think you should go to the church to see if you're cursed by something, well, aside from the poison attempt at the tea party. The latter two were related to Felix's assassination. As his bodyguard, it was only natural for her to be present at the scene of the crime, but to the outsider, it would appear as if she had exceptionally bad luck. In fact, she felt a little, no, a lot, or maybe, extremely unlucky. As Monica was once again contemplating her bad luck, Glenn muttered as he was swinging his legs around ungracefully on his chair. Now Monica had just won the matches, but the chess tournament will be suspended, Lana nodded at Glenn's comment. Surely, they will. Today's holiday, so the situation was not as bad as it seems, since not many students are coming to the school, but tomorrow will be much worse, I think, so the school festival will be suspended too after all, Lana's face darkened at Glenn's grumbling. The school festival is only four days away. If this kind of incident happened four days before the festival, the annulment of the festival would be certain. Lana, who was in charge of the costumes for the play in the school festival, seemed to be severely dejected. No wonder, everyone was looking forward to the festival. Glenn also looked disappointed and shrugged his shoulders, saying, I guess it will. However, Claudia unexpectedly denied their concerns. Comma the school festival will go on as planned. She did not speak to encourage Lana and Glenn. 
She only assured them that the festival would be carried out in her usual gloomy face as if she was speaking of a depressing fact. But Glenn and Lana rebutted dubiously. Even when the second prince assassination attempt just happened, I think they would cancel the festival for the sake of the prince's safety, what the two of them said was an obvious fact. However, Claudia explained to them reluctantly, as though doing it was too much troublesome. Dot. Duke Crockford will definitely enforce the school to continue the festival. Duke Crockford, a great noble who was also Felix's maternal grandfather. He was the man who controlled Sarandia Academy behind the scenes, and everyone knew that the school was under his control. But will Duke Crockford force the school festival to go on as planned, disregarding the safety of the second prince he has been protecting? So Monica asked Claudia fearfully. Um. Well, Duke Crockford is the backer of the second prince, isn't he? Then, shouldn't His Highness's safety be the top priority? Duke Crockford is not that kind of man. Monica had never met Duke Crockford in person, so she knew only as much about him as she had heard from rumors. According to Lewis Miller, he was a ruthlessly ambitious man who would stop at nothing to achieve his goals. I bet they will tighten the security. And because the school festival will be the second prince's debut appearance, the festival will be going on as planned. As a matter of fact, Duke Crockford will always prioritize the second prince's debut over his safety. So long as the second prince is his puppet, he would be unable to decline. The second prince was Duke Crockford's puppet, that's what Casey had said. But for some reason... Monica couldn't help but feel that the word puppet didn't seem to fit for Felix. With an uneasy feeling stirring in her chest, Monica sipped the contents of her cup, hoping that the cause of her tingling spine was from the cold. Extra Story 5 Story of a Certain Boy and His Servant Azareth GT Silent Witch August 21, 2021 5 Minutes A Young Boy, who was the owner of this elegant room mumbling uncomprehendingly as he was looking at the necklace on the table. Occasionally, he would glance back and forth between the grimoire and the necklace in his hands, before placing his small palm on the necklace and chanting the spell that was written in the grimoire. Kama what are you doing, Lord? The servant boy, who had been silently watching his master, asked in an indifferent voice to keep his dismay at bay and the boy who had been staring at the necklace turned his head and looked back, in return. The teacher from basic magic class today told me that a spirit has resided in the necklace I've got from my mother. Yes, I've heard Lady Irene has a good aptitude for magic and made a contract with a high-ranking spirit. Then, won't my grandfather would be pleased if I could do the same thing as my mother? The boy's sky-blue eyes gleamed, leaving his servant in complete loss. Oh, why is my master so dull-witted? Hiding his thought, the servant quietly told him the cruel reality. I doubt your grandfather will be pleased, A, eh, to contract a high-ranking spirit. You must have the same aptitude with a spirit you will make a contract with. But, Lord, you have different aptitude with a spirit Lady Irene had contracted with, so it can't be achieved, in the first place. Making a contract with a high-ranking spirit requires a huge amount of mana and the ability to understand magical formulas. The servant boy was inwardly exasperated, thinking why did he say that when he should have been taught this subject in his class. The boy hung his head down dejectedly, staring down at the necklace. That sight made the servant let out a sigh inwardly. After all, he didn't want to make his master sad. Lord. Could you give me a moment? The servant flipped open his own jacket and pulled out a book that had been tucked on his back. Grown-up people would have been able to sneak a book under his jacket, but the servant was a boy not much older than his master. So, the only way to bring in a book without the adults finding out was to hide it in his jacket, tying it to his body. Here, take this. The boy's eyes lit up when he saw the title of the book the servant held out to him. It's an astronomy book by Mary Harvey, the Star Oracle Witch. I've been hearing you mention of wanting to read this book. Whoa. Thank you. I've been wanting to read that for ages. 
The boy hugged the book to his chest and jumped in delight, expressing his joy with his whole body. Normally, he would scold his master for his ill-mannered behavior, but, only for this time, the servant boy feigned ignorance. The boy, master of the servant boy, had taken an interest in the stars in the night sky. However, the grown-ups always tried to keep such books away from him, saying that astronomy was not necessary for his future. That was why the servant boy had secretly procured the book, only to please his master, nothing more. You know, the, star oracle witch, is one of the seven sages, in fact, she's an amazing prophetess who can forecast the future of the country by watching the movement of the stars. It said there are many fortune tellers in this country, but the only person who's been titled as the prophetess was the, star oracle witch. Many said the color of the stars and the number of times they blink are important, considering that the color of the stars directly indicates the lifespan of the star. I regret to inform you but we should postpone this discussion until later. I believe the daughter of Marcus Shelbury should be arrived by now, so we should get ready. At the servant boy's words, his master pouted. Come and now that reminds me, I promised Bridget to accompany her in dancing practice today, but I don't feel like doing it. You know how bad I was at dancing. Bridget also gets really mad when I step on her feet. Besides I'm not very good at talking to girls. I would be nervous when doing so, which makes it hard to speak properly. I don't think it's appropriate to say such a thing to your future fiancé, of course, I won't dare to say that in public. I did so because it was you, the boy took a deep breath jovially, hugging the book which he had received from the servant like a treasure. That night, the boy was summoned to his grandfather's room but stood stunned by the scene before him. Kneeling at his grandfather's feet was the servant boy whom the boy looked up to like a brother. He was wearing nothing on his upper body, and his white back was severely swollen with whip marks from the chastisement. Gee grandfather. W.Y. He, I've got a report that this mongrel had brought you something unnecessary. My grandfather then directed his gaze to a book on the table. It was a book that the servant boy had secretly procured for him. How? I've had it hidden in my room for sure thought the boy in shock. Come I I'm sorry, it was my fault. I was the one who forced him to bring that book, in other words, he's not following my orders, but yours? How dare a servant like him mistakenly identify his master, with that, his grandfather swung the whip down to the servant's back. The servant, who was not much older than a boy, gritted his teeth to endure the pain without uttering a single word. Please stop, I beg you. Grandfather, please stop, I will never again ask for any more astronomy books. So please, throw that book in the fireplace. After he was ordered by his grandfather, the boy picked up the book on the desk and stood in front of the fireplace. Then, with trembling hands, he tossed his precious book, which the servant boy had taken secretly only for the sake of pleasing his master, into the fireplace. Trying to hold back the tears as he watched the letters burning up, his grandfather revealed another his misconduct in a low voice. I heard today's dance lesson was a disaster, I am sorry, there was a sharp snapping sound as the whip was swung down again. But it was aimed not to the boy, but to the back of the kneeling servant boy, his grandfather knew all too well, it was more effective to hurt the servant whom the boy adored like a brother than to hurt the boy himself. You've brought shame upon me in the eyes of Marcus Shelbury. I am sorry, I'm sorry. I'll do it properly next time. I promise I won't embarrass you again. So, please, after pleading with tears in his eyes to stop whipping the servant, his grandfather delivered a whip for the last time with a single, loud snap. Even so, the servant boy did not scream and held on. There won't be next time, yes. After the boy nodded his head tremblingly, his grandfather cast a cold stare, more frigid than a winter lake, at his badly behaved grandson and spat. To think such a failure as Irene's son, how deplorable.